Good morning. I, Anand Prakash, welcome all of you to the third session of day three of this in-house. So before moving towards our talk, I request all the speakers to please uh, to finish the, their talks within the prescribed time limit so that the audience can ask more questions <laughs> and we can keep our session on the time. So let's start. The first speaker of this session is A. Raghunathan from EEG. Title of his talk is A Wide Band Signal Pol Single Polarization Radio Receiver, Receiver Precursor to Low Frequency Radio Telescope. Uh, so today I'm going to, uh, to talk about uh, the uh, radio receiver uh, built for low frequency applications uh, by the Electronics Engineering Group of RLI. So what is this uh, radio receiver, why is it built and what relationship it has got with uh, square kilometer array project, what are its alien features, all those things will come in, in, in the slides uh, which will follow. So I'm happy to say now, should be turned on or it can be left. <laughs> I'm happy to say that this, this telescope or this antenna or uh, radio telescope has been the outcome of a dedicated effort of every member of EG, dedicated effort of all members, I should say, of EG over the past two years. So, so that has resulted in the outcome of this. And uh, I take this opportunity to thank all of them who stood beside me in uh, completing this project. So what I have shown here are two people who are the principal advisors, Desh, Avinash Deshpande and Shiv Sethi. And under their uh, leadership, their advice, this instrument has been built. And all these people who are part of Kuli, part of EG are the collaborators, contributing significantly in different parts of the receiver systems, starting from antenna to uh, digital receiver system. So in my outline of my talk, I'll touch upon the introduction to square kilometer array project, which is a mega project, an international effort and RRI's initiatives in its participation in this mega project. And I will come to the proposal made to build a low frequency telescope, low frequency radio telescope and its scientific and engineering motivations. Before even building such a big telescope, we tried to build a precursor to L40 which is a low frequency radio telescope in the form of a two element interferometer. So the, the talk follows the salient features of it, which used many technologies developed in the laboratory. So finally, I will conclude with some observational results using both single as well as two element, two antenna elements. So a square kilometer array project is the most sensitive telescope covering a wide frequency range from starting from 50 megahertz to 25 gigahertz using three different antennas shown here. One is log periodic and both of and other two are dish based. The scientific objective basically is to address several fundamental questions in astronomy that is in general particularly the SCALO, which is the telescope covering low frequency range starting from 50 to 450 megahertz addresses are, 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 are designed to primarily detect redshift 21 centimeter hydrogen line and do pulsar search and detect. So RRI's initiatives in participating this, in this SCA, in this SKA project 
comes in the form of developing state of the art digital hardware and firmware for SKA. That is number one. Number two is to create its own in house facility by building a low frequency radio telescope, which can be used to test the hardware and firmware developed in the lab and to carry out most important is to uh, research activities in low frequency region of a radio. Spectrum. The scientific and engineering motivations of LFRT, which is low frequency radio telescopes, are basically three number one. It is being used as a technology demonstrator, which means whatever you develop in the laboratory for a radio telescope, you combine them all and test their functionalities in the in, in, in building the radio telescope, like antennas and uh, analog delay lines, high dynamic range front end receiver, back end receivers, and so on. That's number one. Number two is we can use it, use LF40 as an astronomical facility aided by large instantaneous bandwidth, multi beams in the sky, and of course, most important is short baselines. When the facility takes up uh, its uh, 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 prescribed size. The third one is it can also be used as a test platform for characterizing the tile processing module if at all and validate multi beam firmware being developed for SK. These are primary requirements, primary driving goals for uh, this instrument built here. So, I will come to the uh, the precursor to LFRT. LFRT is a very big project, but as a precursor to it, what we developed in the laboratory in the laboratory is a two element interferometer and that can be expanded to a bigger scale once we completely understand the, the nature of it. So, the a two element interferometer has been built as a precursor to LFRT using two wideband single polarization radio receivers. It is expected to operate over 30 to 360. Remember, the SKA low has got a low frequency bandwidth of about a decade, and we have kept that in mind and said that our instrument, what we build in the laboratory, also should have a decade bandwidth. So, this instrument is expected to cover a more than decade, which is 30 to 360. We used to two, one is to three bandwidth antennas to operate in this decade band. This instrument has been designed to have a 2 pi stereo radian field of view dynamic range more than 50 dB and output spectrum at 1024 frequency channels. So, two element interferometer is a technology demonstrator. When I say that, what does it mean? It means that using this instrument, we will be able to validate the wideband antennas that we have developed in the, in the laboratory, high dynamic range front end back end receivers which are developed by colleagues of EEG and of course most important is uh, compact delay lines which are analog in nature. So, these are the primary uh, elements which have gone into the receiver system in, in, in building making it complete. Okay? So, when I say when I try characterizing the telescope it is basically characterizing each of these components which are developed in the laboratory. So, first thing is I say antenna, antenna is uh, what we developed is shown here. We developed two, two antennas of 1 is to 3 bandwidth antennas and both of them put together will give you a bandwidth or uh, will give you a frequency range 30 to 360 which is more than a decade. So, these are the dimensions and these are exactly identical except their sizes are different. They perform equally well in the same way for the entire bandwidth. These are scaled. This is antenna for low frequency, this is antenna for high frequency covering from 120 to 360 and this is 30 to 90. What this slide is showing the, the important characteristics which are basically impedance characteristics as well as radiation patterns. This first row is for low frequency and the second row is for high frequency and the, the two important things have been kept in mind. One to have uh, want to have a spectral response of the antenna free from undesired spectral features, which will help in calibration of the band pass of the receiver system, number one. Number two, 
to have patterns as much as possible independent of frequency. So these two things have been kept in mind and were designed. So what you see here, the reflection coefficient radiation pattern of the low frequency antenna and same thing reflection coefficient and radiation pattern of high frequency antenna. If you see these, the, the, the spectral response is smooth more or less without any king's abrupt variation as a function of frequency and all patterns are bunched together saying that they all are almost frequency independent. So these are the antenna characteristics. Uh, of the uh, the characteristics of the data built at built, uh, built by EG. So then the second one is high dynamic range front end receiver. What you are showing here is the electronics. Once the antenna signal comes out, it has to be processed in the form of uh, uh, amplifying with minimum degradation in its signal to noise ratio and filtering to remove unwanted signals. And of course, and then. Uh, 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 giving enough signal before it gets into the digitizer where, digitizing, uh, digitizing, where the signal will be sampled and uh, processed. So these are the characteristics showing that the front end receiver has almost a gain of 50 dB. Noise figure is about a dB, less of dB and dynamic range is more than 50 dB, which is absolutely important whenever you talk about uh, uh, operation with observation in the presence of RFI. So third one is a backend receiver. This backend receiver has been built using the Voltex 6 uh, FPGA and it is able to handle about 8 analog inputs each having a bandwidth of 175 megahertz and the dynamic range of backend receiver is about 80 dB. So the, what is shown here, the schematic and then the implemented backend receiver and the important uh, characteristic of, the, of this. So after doing all these things, we were ready to go to the field and what you see here is the single element deployment in Gaurabhidhanur, which is a site about 80 kilometers from here, which we use for all our observation, all our testings. So we went there, deployed it and then took a drift scan across the galactic plane and what you see here are the response of the instrument at all these bands. If you observe the, the responses or the frequency responses uh, at all those frequencies are almost bunched together. They all follow a similar trend. They all have similar uh, trend uh, whenever there, is a, there was a transit of a galactic plane across the meridian. So identical response in all the bands is indicating the frequency independent behavior of the antennas. Number two. After subtracting, the, after getting this sky data we, and removing all known inputs coming to the antenna, we expected the, the galactic, which is the main contributor, to be seen. What you see here, what you see here is, is that the measurement of what you see as a blue line is expected galactic background. So if you see here in all the bands, Okay, if, if uh, this ripple, we understand the cause of the ripple and this is because of the cable connecting the antenna and the uh, amplifier and that can be removed once, yeah, once the length is known. If you remove all these things, the trend, what you see in the measurement and of course the predicted are not too far away from each other. So, then, so we, we confirmed in this, the frequency independent and of course, we tried getting the uh, galactic contribution close to what we expected. This was one phase of the experiment using single element. Then we went for two element deployment, okay. So we wanted to demonstrate antenna characteristics, dynamic, dynamic range characteristics and third one is the compact, uh, third one is the uh, delay life. This exercise of, of uh, configuring antennas in the phased array mode was to demonstrate the effectiveness of the compact delay line which you developed in the laboratory. So this is the configuration have, where you have two antennas separated by a finite distance d and you, have, you introduce a delay here to steer the beam in the sky by a known amount. So if you want to operate in the phased array mode, three basic 
things have to be found out. One is the spacing between two antennas, which is D here and D here, and differential delay between the receivers, which is to be corrected before applying known amount of delay and observing a shift in the beam in the sky. And of course, the amount of delay required to deflect the synthesized beam to a predetermined position in the sky. So, these are all these are all the three things which are required before even demonstrating the effect of a compact delay line. So, so first thing is the delay, which is the distance between these two. We, we chose the distance between two antennas in such a way that the degradation in the impedance characteristics is minimum. Based on that, we chose the distance and it turned out to be about 80 centimeter and 300 centimeter for these two antennas. So, this plot shows that where degradation because of future coupling starts occurring and we stop there and based on that we decided the distance between the two. And differential delay between the two receivers was observed to be much less than our sampling clock. There was no need to correct for the differential delay between two receivers and if you see here they are all less than a clock cycle. So, it was fine we do not have we did not have to correct for the differential time delay and third one is what we wanted to calculate, we wanted to demonstrate shift in the beam. So, what we did was is the following, if you see here this is the synthesized beam of two antennas when you combine together without any delay and what you see here is the beam peak, peaking at the zenith and we said let us shift the beam by a known amount, let us say by 20 degrees. Okay, let us shift it deliberately. Let us say we want to shift it. So, to shift the beam in the sky, we calculated the amount of delay required in each of the antenna paths uh, and it came around 1 nanosecond, 4 nanosecond. So, if you introduce 1 nanosecond and 4 nanosecond in these two antenna paths, which are for two different frequency range, you will be able to shift the beam in the sky by by known amount which is 20 degree. This is we this was our assumption we began with this and then we went to demonstrate that we could get this. Here comes the the third development which is the which is the compact baseline compact delay line. Normally compact delay lines are realized using cables of certain length, but the problem problem comes when the delay line becomes too large too big in size. So, we wanted to realize, we wanted to minimize that the, the, the technique we adopted was to create a medium, was to develop a medium of high dielectric constant. Okay? So, we used water and some PVC material to develop a composite medium which has got, which has, which could get a dielectric constant of about 25. So, this using this 25 dielectric constant, we were able to reduce the length of the transmission line to get the required amount of delay by a factor of 5. Okay? We, we, we could make, we could compact it, we could make it so compact by going for this technique of uh, developing transmission line on a composite dielectric medium. This is, this was our third development and we used it to demonstrate. Right? So, so we used this technique. To, to, to a design transmission line which could give about 1.3 nanosecond and 5.2 nanosecond which are the required delays to shift the beam in the sky. So, we, developed, we designed these lines and we incorporated in the one of the antenna paths when we deployed two antennas in the field. So, when we did that what you see is the following. Blue, blue line represents the peak response of the antenna when no delays, when, no, when black line, rep, black curve represents the response when there was no delay introduced. However, when you introduce delay, this gets shifted by finite amount. Same thing is true here also, you can see peaks are shifted laterally, peaks are sp shifted in space. Okay. So, this was our demonstration, what was, what was expected are, are these and what was measured are these. At, at 58 megahertz expected was around 20 degree in the beam shift and what we measured was 19 and same thing is seen here also. So, this shift in the peak demonstrated the water based delay line can indeed be used to shift the beam in the sky. So, third one of course. We use the same technique 
in this the error is more there is more more error in this compared to these two we understand that and we want to find out no expectation also on this yeah uh, just I see, understand this is, is this is, the is if you see shift will depend on the frequency right? absolutely absolutely yeah. you see if you if you see i will go back to my earlier slides huh. if you see here these are all the patterns okay patterns are not you know 100% independent of frequency mm -hmm. there is some amount of dispersion in their characteristics as a function of frequency this dispersion is leading to that effect okay, okay. Thank you. all right so so after seeing this we did one more experiment of keeping the receivers far apart at several wavelengths at the higher frequency and we wanted to see the fringe coming out by that and of course to our, uh, and it, it did indeed produce fringe what you expect here these are all what is shown here are at two discrete frequencies same thing definitely can be expected at other frequencies also so this also you know demonstrated our uh, the the uh, interferometer uh, uh, functioning of the interferometer so i conclude by saying that we have successfully built a two element interferometer which is considered as a precursor to uh, low frequency radio astronomy low frequency radio telescope using the state of the art technologies developed in the lab wideband nature and frequency independence of antennas have been validated by observing the galactic center in the drift scan mode and number 3 water based compact delay line has been used to demonstrate shift in the beam in the sky using the high dynamic range front end and back end receivers sky spectrum uh, has been measured for very fine spectral resolution of about 100 kilohertz so we were able to demonstrate all aspects of technology we developed in the laboratory by doing sky observation so after saying this i by i acknowledge help from everyone in mechanical workshop and Gorbidinur observatory uh, who extended their help in at various stages of development, deployment and testing of radio receiver systems. What you see here, of course, a small group who, who visited the uh, observatory, who visited the uh, Gorbidinur when the antennas were deployed. It's a group in front of uh, two antennas developed for covering 30 to 360 MHz wide frequency range. Thank you. When you placed your uh, two antennas uh, uh, only 86 centimeter apart, how do you ensure that they are not cross talking no, no, through their... Uh, it's heavy. You can see this. The cross talk you can see crosstalk in the impedance characteristic of each of the antennas. But it will change the uh, band so shape completely. It will change. But when we, we, we iterated the distance by looking at the response of each of these, okay, when you come very close and obviously it gets degraded, okay, we never went for it even though in principle you can do it. Okay, but since the hours, this phase is a demonstration phase, we kept at a distance which gave not too much of degradation in the impedance characteristic. So, how the choice comes actually, more number of antenna based on the range of? No, no, field of coverage. Field of field. Uh -huh. If you want more field simultaneously to be covered, you have to have large number of antennas. And how localization is done actually is very simple point, but I wanted to understand. Localization means what do you mean? Uh, localization of uh, stars or uh, no, no, we never went for it. Okay. We simply went for uh, the galactic plane transit. Okay. okay, because our beams are so wide. Okay, you cannot uh, distinguish any point source in the sky. Because something comes from sky. True, true, true. What you see, you see, look, what you see now, what you see, you know, I will go to the last slide, wherein, wherein. You can see 
the fringe coming up, it is because of the Cassier source entering our beam. Cassier, the beam of uh, with this wide distance is narrow, so that the that point source is able to produce fringe in the outer. This is because of the Cassier uh, astronomical source. Thank you. So let's thank Raghu again, and I would like to invite the director to confer the moment to Raghu. Please come. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Absolutely. The next speaker of the session is Surajit Pal. Title of his talk is Busting a Few Myths About Cluster Diffuse Radio Emission. Good morning, and thanks to the organizer for giving this opportunity to uh, present my work. Uh, yeah, first of all, I when I submitted my uh, abstract. Then I did not have the idea how much time I will get. So from few to only one myth I will be talking about. So that change uh, in the title is there. And this work has been done. Uh, I mean, the, uh, two of my PhD students uh, involved in this uh, whole work that I will be presenting. And some other uh, collaborators, obviously, but they are the major contributor. OK, so yeah, uh, so uh, this is the, I mean, artist impression of our universe from the starting point to today's uh, picture. So, uh, and it also shows that uh, from the, how, from the uh, initial density fluctuation um, seen in the cosmic microwave background grows into structure in the late stage. So this structure formation, we uh, call it a hierarchical structure formation because smaller object forms first and it builds up uh, in time and finally uh, produces the uh, biggest object that we uh, see today, round object, is the galaxy clusters and all. But uh, thing is that while in the initial stage they were uh, linearly growing, at the late stage they have the uh, non-linear growth. Uh, in the, uh, uh, I mean, their formation. So that was an artist impression. If we look into our uh, sky uh, directly, uh, so uh, the galaxies, uh, each galaxy is here uh, plotted on the sky. You can see if we look through our, uh, our uh, I mean, uh, in the red ship plane, that is uh, line of sight, you see there are structures in the line of sight. And if you project it on the sky, you will see the uh, similar structures. What are the structures? They are not just placed randomly. They are in a um, uh, filamentary structure, which we call as the cosmic wave. And in that, if you see that higher uh, concentration of the cosmic wave, uh, there you form the uh, largest structures, like galaxy groups, clusters, and all. And each of these groups consist of tens of galaxies and the clusters consist of hundreds of galaxies. And mass range is quite uh, large, which is few times 10 to the power 12 solar mass to 10 to the power 15 solar mass. Uh, in the However, this picture was a static picture because we cannot uh, do the dynamical evolution, I mean study the dynamical evolution from observation because we have, uh, I mean, our life uh, time is very short, uh, considering their uh, evolution time, which is giga year of uh, time. So we have to go into uh, simulating this thing from the uh, whatever understanding we already have about the structure formation. So what we have done is that the primordial uh, uh, density fluctuation uh, is put into uh, uh, simulations uh, where we simulated a 128 mega per second volume, which is quite large uh, in that context. And uh, uh, we are evolving it in a, a dark matter and baryon uh, environment and our cosmology is lambda CDM cosmology. So if you see that structure starting from here grows and uh, uh, first of all, these circles are showing the virial radius of each of the object we have determined from the simulation. And if you see that initially they are, uh, I mean, 
smaller objects uh, dispersed uh, in the whole range, but slowly they go into the filaments and come to the um, uh, uh, nodes of the, uh, of, uh, I mean, uh, this volume and there they form the largest object. And in this, they follow some of the uh, mass functions and it changes with uh, redshift as, as you go in uh, deeper in redshift, uh, uh, sorry, lower in redshift, more and more uh, high mass objects are forming. That is the hierarchical formation. However, in the end, there is some thing going on why we get more number of uh, large structures. Though error bar is large, but uh, it has been shown, uh, seen in the uh, uh, simulation as well. So this, uh, uh, since it is building hierarchically, the initial assumption or uh, the, uh, what I call the myth was that this structure in large scale follow the self similarity. Okay, and uh, that is the myth, why? Because they translated into all kind of uh, parameters, I mean all the scientists, we are also involved in that, that finding correlation among all the objects. So what is self-similarity? You can see that uh, we always uh, encounter such self-similarities in geometrical shapes. So from starting from this fractal, so starting from smaller object, it's a building block that makes the bigger one and all are say, same in their geometrical shape. Size is just increasing. Similarly, the natural um, example is broccoli, where you can see that each of the building block is same as the uh, final structure. So this is the self similarity and physicists uh, 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 thought that all uh, object will follow this in that mass range that I am talking about 10 to the 12 to 10 to the 15 solar mass. And uh, they, we, uh, I mean, uh, it's about uh, 1980 when these people introduced the concept of self similarity, but there they told that we have in ignored few things that uh, um, uh, initial uh, universe is scale free and that grows and uh, remains scale free and um, uh, uh, the late stage nonlinearity has not been considered and also the other con uh, assumptions were that all whether dark matter all the uh, or the uh, uh, gas are collisionless medium. Okay, and also they did not consider, this is the major part that non-gravitational processes in building these uh, systems. So people certainly uh, tried correlating or pro, uh, I mean uh, looking at the correlation and various correlation like thermal correlation or the non-thermal, thermal emission, x-ray emission, this radio emission. So they tried looking at the correlation, fine, they found the correlation, but thing is that only with few of the uh, available, um, uh, I mean, uh, observations, which are mainly uh, massive structures, massive galaxy clusters, okay. And the problem was not with uh, making that um, correlation, they projected or pre uh, predicted the uh, system at lower mass with the, that correlation, because they thought that correlation will hold always. And what the, uh, these people have done, um, Kasana at all, uh, they told that this uh, green line may be visible, I don't know, I have taken from their paper only. So this green line shows the what LOFAR could detect. This is the mass range and this is detectability of the uh, sources. So LOFAR cannot detect uh, more than 1% of the object which have uh, mass uh, below 10 to 5 into 10 to the power 14 solar mass. This was the prediction in 2010 before LOFAR came into the picture. So if you see the systems, uh, I mean, it's not like that I am talking about this from the, for the first time uh, during 1999 and 2000, the, uh, these people uh, showed that in thermal emission also there is a uh, deviation from the uh, scaling and as well as in the, uh, uh, this uh, entropy, they saw there is deviation. But this was not the mainstream or uh, even uh, another thing they have not done is that they did not try that there is a break or some uh, deviation, uh, continuous deviation is happening. They told that possibly the whole system is in a different correlation, not following the uh, usual correlation that has been. 
So uh, this lead uh, led us to uh, actually work on uh, some simulation uh, of the systems in a large uh, mass range. And what we saw that yes, indeed, there is a break kind of thing. So what we did, we performed, uh, I mean, we checked that if there is a um, uh, break in the uh, whole correlation, whether it is completely deviating, suddenly deviating or uh, slowly deviating. Uh, though our goal was to uh, actually catch the point where it is breaking, that's why we uh, thought that uh, some, uh, uh, I mean, fitting with chi-square uh, minimization, we will uh, see what is the break point. And it came out to be around 8 into 10 to the 13 solar mass, which can be roughly taken as 1 into 10 to the 14 solar mass. But we uh, uh, won't say that this is what uh, actually the break is. This can be a continuous uh, change. The reason we could not find anything why it is uh, happening, obviously some non-gravitational process is happening, but one thing we saw that uh, baryon fraction in these systems are suddenly dropping beyond this point. So that could be one reason. Now going into the non-gravitational processes, if you see this structure formation, I have focused into these uh, systems and you can see that this is the thermal evaluation and this is the uh, turbulence evolving in the system. And these are the engines which produce uh, high energy particles. So uh, uh, thermal energy converted to non-thermal energy. So if that is happening and uh, this kind of vigorous, uh, I mean, uh, uh, changes are uh, happening in the system. So uh, we cannot actually ignore the non-gravitational processes. So what we uh, did is that since we can see that non-thermal emission are uh, uh, dominant in these systems. What we did is that we uh, uh, simulated the systems, made a, a mock sample catalog, and there we computed the synchrotron radio emission numerically. So uh, what uh, goes into it, that we see that there is merger shocks, and as well as there are uh, turbulence in the system. So we took that uh, particle are accelerated and uh, even magnetic field are amplified in these systems through these uh, processes and uh, whatever uh, particle spectrum, energy spectrum comes that we uh, uh, plug into this synchrotron uh, radio emission formula and numerically can compute it that what could be the radio power from this system. What we saw is very interesting that again it showed that beyond uh, some point, it is around uh, 3 or 4 into 10 to the power 14 solar mass, there is uh, turning. Uh, so correlation for high mass still holds good, whatever people have found, but low mass, it is not holding good. And that led us to predict that how much fraction of object could be actually observed uh, in future. So what we saw that UGMRT kind of uh, uh, telescope or maybe lower uh, kind of telescope will detect more than 5% uh, 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 of the low mass systems. This is only uh, calculated on the low mass systems, though we have plotted all the things, but low mass systems uh, can be detected uh, at 5%. Uh, and when square kilometer array comes into the picture, we will be detecting more than 20% of uh, those sources with radio emission, radio halo emission. So this was our prediction and that led us to start the first uh, systematic study of these systems with UJMRT and LOFAR, some uh, data was uh, public at that time. So what we found is that uh, we uh, uh, then published the first paper on this uh, uh, focused low mass study uh, with radio emission. And uh, what we saw that uh, among our 14 objects, 35% of the objects actually showed some of diffuse emission, not the halo emission, and uh, two of them showed the diffuse emission. That means around 14% uh, showed uh, radio halo emission, which was um, according to uh, Kasano et al. Uh, it would have been, because uh, why I'm talking about Kasano et al, that they are the, um, I mean, authority kind of thing. So what they told is that, um, below 1% uh, actually goes into 14% in our case, but it is very small amount, I mean, number of objects that we have observed, uh, which is only 14. So we cannot claim it a big thing, but 
uh, in the next year, they themselves published a paper from all the first sky and out of hundreds of sample, they found around 6% having radio halo, which was our prediction itself, like 5% uh, and beyond we uh, predicted. So that is really, in, uh, I mean, uh, interesting and uh, uh, this thing for us and we have uh, now uh, take into uh, it into further uh, uh, new, um, I mean, the systematic study, large scale study uh, that I will talk about. But before that, what is the current situation? If you see the current situation of this, still we are going with some uh, correlation uh, plot, which is not very um, uh, much differing uh, from uh, Kasame at all. But what we can see that at uh, low mass range, the fluctuation is big, huge fluctuation. And another thing is that. Uh, the number of uh, object available still very low. Uh, so this gives us the motivation that we should do uh, a large scale, um, uh, I mean, search uh, project with that to fill this gap so that we confidently can say that, okay, this is what we told and this is what is happening. And for that, we have chosen the uh, largest uh, cluster catalog, uh, the Planck and uh, SPT catalog. Uh, and uh, from that, we have shortlisted some sources and uh, which is spanning in the sky like this and uh, proposed for UGMT ob observation and we uh, fortunately got the time. And uh, uh, yeah, this is the starting point. Again, only a few uh, dozen of uh, objects, but we'll scale it to uh, like hundreds or 200 objects in uh, next few years. That is the goal of this project and I'm Hopeful that that will give us a good result, which will tell that okay, there is this um, correlation does not always exist in wide mass range. There is a break in that or deviation in the correlation. Yeah, thank you. Questions? Okay, oh. so uh, it's a simple hydrodynamic, and um, uh, the uh, dark matter is dealt like. Uh, uh, particle. So it's a Poiseau equation sol solver and uh, hydrodynamics solved by Euler equations. Okay. And uh, this self similarity is uh, predicted. Is it like uh, near the criticality or something like that? Or uh, so in in the low low mass case, you are saying that it is deviating from the self similarity. Yeah. So uh, no. Self-similar structures usually appear near, uh, I mean, in, in condensed matter systems near criticality, near phase transition and criticality. Ah, okay. So, so uh, I was just thinking whether no, uh, I, I mean, uh, some correlations. Uh, already these are like uh, near collisionless medium. So uh, what condensed matter uh, physicists would do, uh, the phase transition, yes, that kind of phase transition is not there. But only thing is that some non-gravitational process which uh, may be dominating this system, which will deviate it from the uh, normal self-similarity because normal self-similarity is claimed from the spherical collapse model, which is uh, very idealized. Uh, it does not hold in this kind of systems. So let's thank again Surajit for such a nice talk. Our next speaker is Vishnu Dev Mish. Title of his talk is Leaning Induced Layer Undulated Tilted Symmetric Phase of Asymmetric Bent Core Liquid Crystals. Vishnu. Uh, thank you, Anand. And uh, thanks, uh, organizer, for giving me an opportunity to present my work. So, in this work, we experimentally investigated a bent core molecular system uh, and we proposed a new mechanism to explain the layer undulated symmetric phase in this. So, I will start with a short introduction uh, about the liquid crystal for the broad audience. So liquid crystals, as the name suggests, it is liquid, it flows like liquid, and uh, simultaneously it exhibits some orientational or translational order like crystals. So the um, essential condition in formation of liquid crystal is the anisotropic shape of the molecule, which could be rod or bent shape or disc-like molecules. So the, dry, uh, the control parameter here is the temperature. So at the high temperature range, the orientation as well as position of the molecules are completely ra uh, random. 
so it is a isotropic fluid with lowering the temperature all these uh, molecules orient in one direction this average uh, direction is called director and the center of mass of the molecule is still completely random so this is what is called uh, pneumatic phase at even lower temperatures these uh, there is a translational order in one direction so that it forms a layered kind of a structure within the layer the molecules are free to roam around and there is one uh, uh, one dimensional uh, translational order there could also be some tilted phase at the lowest temperature range uh, it forms a perfect uh, crystalline structure now my uh, work is based on bent core molecule it consists of uh, uh, electron rich aromatic core and at the end of the molecule there is a long aliphatic chain so because of this electron distribution there is a non zero dipole moment along the bent direction so these molecules uh, possess a c2 v symmetry meaning that there is a two fold rotation axis along the bent direction and this is the mirror plane and these two are just the representation of the same molecule if i rotate it cl uh, clockwise or counter clockwise by 90 degrees so here the bent axis is pointing outward and here it is uh, downward now the because of the shape of the molecules the efficient pack, packing of these molecules will lead to formation of a layered structure and since uh, each of these molecules have non zero dipole moment this leads to uh, layer polarization in the system and depending on the polarization in the successive layers this will form uh, ferroelectric or anti ferroelectric kind of phases and because uh, these are uh, biaxial molecules and they form uh, ferroelectric phases their response to the applied electric field is very fast and which is why they, they could be used in uh, some applications where fast switching is required now uh, this is the same uh, okay so uh, apart from the application they also exhibit a rich variety of phase behavior and i'm going to focus only on the uh, layered part of it so this is the simplest example where which is called symmetric ap symmetric means layered structure a means the director the average orientation is uh, along the layer normal and p is along the layers so and this is the mirror plane here now this is the same representation if we look it from the right now uh, there could be two kind of tilt in this kind of uh, organization one is where this molecular plane and the uh, layer normal they remains coplanar whereas the director is tilted at some angle so this retains the uh, mirror symmetry and the p has a uh, longitudinal component along the layer normal so this kind of molecular configuration is what is called leaning second kind of tilt will be where the molecular plane itself is tilted with respect to the layer normal in that case this mirror symmetry will be broken and this phase will uh, appear chiral so the individual molecules are a chiral but their uh, arrangement geometrical arrangement itself will lead to a macroscopic chirality in the system so origin of this chirality was discussed by deepak in the uh, on the first day uh, now uh, based on the polarization uh, strength there could be some kind of frustrated phases so it arises because uh, keeping lot of dipole moments in one direction is er energetically not favorable so for a strong enough polarization these uh, dipoles will split and since this split cannot span over whole layer they will form some finite size stripes and these stripes will be separated by some defect lines and in order to incorporate these defect lines the layer will uh, undulate to form a what we call uh, polarization modulated layer undulated structure uh, so uh, uh, other possibility is these stripes will slide halfway through these uh, layers and form column of phases along the columns this is liquid and there is a two dimensional structure now both of these structures can be characterized by a two dimensional lattice one lattice parameter is the layer thickness and the other is modulation along the layer so and uh, to distinguish between since both of them are characterized by two dimensional lattice we can distinguish between them by uh, measuring this uh, uh, temperature dependence of the of this periodicity so since here there is a discrete boundary 
so these columns cannot change much whereas here with decreasing temperature this display will, the polarization will increase the display will also increase and therefore this uh, periodicity will also increase with uh, decreasing temperature so in uh, the, so uh, the compound i worked on this is the uh, its chemical formula it's it is an asymmetric bent core molecule asymmetric means one arm is completely different from the other and here this r value is changing from 8 to 16 so in DSC measurements, we found that there, uh, all these compounds exhibit one enantiotropic liquid crystal phase. Enantiotropic means in heating as well as cooling, this uh, phase exists. Now, uh, this is transition temperature with different chain length of these molecules. And we saw uh, all of these compounds uh, exhibit one liquid crystal phase. Now, uh, this is the dielectric constant with respect to temperature. This discontinuity detects the phase transition and it, it matches with DSC and all the other experiments. The dielectric constant value is very low, uh, close to 5, which indicates that it, the system may not be polar. And to confirm this, we did switching current measurement where we applied a triangular wave voltage and measured the current response. So in the current, the current response consists of some capacitive part, uh, conductive part, and if there is polarization, some extra peak appears on this background. So in our case, there is no uh, such uh, polar polarization reversal current response, which confirms that this phase are not pro, uh, polar. Uh, despite of uh, no polarization, in the POM, in uh, microscopy, a thin sample between cross polarizer appear like this. So this fan texture is uh, indicative of uh, layer undulated structures. And if we apply a very high field, this color changes gradually from red to green, uh, blue and it stabilizes here in some metastable meta uh, state. And this change is irreversible. So some experiments which I'm not showing here, we confirm that this change is occurring because of the uh, uh, coupling between uh, dielectric anisotropy of the system and the applied electric field. In uh, X-ray measurement, we found there are uh, uh, a lot of uh, peaks, uh, strong peaks in the small angle region. And their wave vector corresponds to in the ratio of 1 is to 2 is to 3, which, uh, which suggests that uh, there is a lamellar structure. And this diffuse peak in the wide angle region suggests that the, uh, within the layers, the, there is a liquid lake order. Now, if we uh, perform some uh, high resolution measurement in this highlighted area, we saw a lot of small angle uh, peaks, which suggests that in addition to this uh, layered order, there is some additional order. And th these peaks are represented, this, this uh, inset represents the uh, Fourier domain of these peaks, where this z axis uh, corresponds to layer uh, la along the layer normal direction and these are along the layers. So from this experiment, we calculated the de-spacing, the layer thickness is 44, whereas the molecular length was 50 angstrom. So from here, we found that this uh, molecules are tilted within the layer at some angle of 23 degrees. Also, we performed uh, scanning electron microscopy, where we uh, heated the sample in the liquid crystal phase and plunged it to, into liquid nitrogen. And we saw that there are some uh, periodic structure there also. And these uh, length scale matches exactly with the what we calculated from the XRD. So uh, to index this, uh, these uh, uh, peaks, uh, so since there is an order in addition to layer, so the simplest assumption is a two-dimensional lattice. So we tried to index all these peaks and the best fit we got with the two-dimensional rectangular lattice. Uh, okay, and okay, so th this uh, SCM measurement kind uh, of support the XRD results also. So since we know that uh, there is a 2D structure from XRD, but as I told you earlier that uh, 2D structure means it could either be layer undulated or column of phases. But in column of phases with temperature, this periodicity does not change much. Uh, in our case, this periodicity along the layers this changes significantly with lowering the temperature, which confirms that this is a layer undulated phase. 
uh, second part is when we uh, we confirm that uh, from the polarization uh, current response and the dielectric that there is no polar uh, there is no polar order in the system now uh, the usually this undulated uh, phases are uh, driven by the high polarization but in our case we see no polarization so the mechanism we proposed is is following so these molecules are uh, uh, strongly asymmetric one arm is very different and there is a polar moiety in the one of the arm so there is this polar the usual consideration is polarization is along the bent direction but in this case there is a non zero polar component along the layer long along the molecular long axis also which leads to the uh, display of the polar uh, display of the molecules in the longitudinal direction and another thing is in the leaning configuration one of the arm is tilted relatively larger than the other arm so uh, because of this the the uh, arm in the down part they will require more space to accommodate whereas there will be some empty space in the uh, on the upper uh, upper part of the layers so to efficiently pack this structure the layer has to bend uh, this way so in the proposed model the at the higher curvature region the molecules acquire a leaning kind of configuration and in order to form a continuous layer in the middle they for, uh, they acquire a symmetric cp kind of configuration and uh, so because uh, since this consists of uh, two kind of tilt we call it a double tilted symmetric structure and uh, uh, by applying a field Uh, since in pum we saw there was no textural change the structure remains exactly same only color changes which is uh, associated with this change so molecules are locally oriented uh, reorient uh, such that the structure remains exactly same only the uh, color of the system is changing so in conclusion we experimentally investigated a homologous series of compounds which which exhibits uh, layer undulated symmetric phase and layer undulation here is uh, coming from the leaning of the molecule and leaning coming from the asymmetric uh, molecular structure of these molecules and we proposed a double tilted uh, symmetric structure uh, for these experimental observations uh, st srinivas and uh, arun rai were involved in this work and i would like to acknowledge vasudha ma'am and yatindran for help in experiments uh, dr srinivas performed all the chemical characterization is this of these compounds and uh, i have had very uh, useful discussion with professor uh, madhusudan and professor ragunathan during this work and thank you for your attention questions i mean my largely curiosity driven the undulation what's the scale i mean how much is the undulation relative to the plane yeah this undulation mm -hmm. what's the how so much is it like the length scale is 450 angstrom Which no, that's the periodicity you're talking that, about. That this that's way, huh? D. Uh, the D value is nearly fifty. Okay. Slightly smaller. So these are where uh, some homologous compounds. So depending on the chain length, it varies from forty-four to fifty angstrom. And this uh, modulation period was order of uh, magnitude larger than this layer space. Uh, Vishnu, you mentioned uh, general question that uh, you ha you can have this. Uh, ferromagnetic and anti anti ferromagnetic order based yeah, ferro on ferroelectric like and huh? ferro ferroelectric sorry so uh, now what determines uh, whether it will be anti uh, or ferroelectric ferro so or so that depends on the uh, direction of this polarization so again this uh, becomes like so uh, keeping on polarization in one direction mm. is energetically uh, not favorable so in general what uh, what does is in the in the real system usually one layer is still uh, this polar vector is this way the other will be directed in the opposite way so there will be anti parallel uh, configuration of this polar vector so ground but, states okay. generally experimentally is found that they are anti ferroelectric this p I will see. be uh, th the direction of p will alternate from in the successive layers so how uh, ground state like how do you excite by temperature like uh, by applying field oh okay if you supply that then it, uh, they may change uh, and they will get uh, acquire some other configuration so one uh, usually people say that i mean in the articles 
one experiment they demonstrated what they did is they attached a very bulky group in so this is a bent core molecule one uh, side they attached the very big uh, moiety kind of thing very long chain and their uh, proposal was that if there is a asymmetry in the uh, in the molecular arms in that case most probably they will lean yeah nice uh, work uh, in the slide where you showed the dielectric constant measurement i think there are peaks due to polarization uh, would you be able to comment why the uh, what's what decides amplitude and why are they spaced right? so um, if you apply uh, so the system is like there is a capacitive uh, plate capacitor kind of ar uh, arrangement and we are filling the sample in between so if you apply a triangular wave so there will be some conductive response which will follow the applied field proportional to the applied voltage capacitive response will go like uh, dv by dt so that will uh, for a triangular wave voltage that will be a square wave and combination of these two will be like this and if there is a polarization after some threshold they will switch since we are changing the uh, direction of the since it is ac field so because of the switching on top of there will be some uh, delta kind of peak the thickness those thing will de uh, depend on how i mean how much polarization is there so uh, area under this peak will give me the total polarization of the system okay thank you nice work <laughs> thanks then let's thank vishnu again for a nice and coherent introductory talk Our next speaker is Biman Nath. Title of his talk is "A New Tool in the Study of the Circumgalactic Medium." Biman, please. Thanks, um, and thanks um, the organizers for asking me to give this talk um, at, uh, in the in-house. Um, although I have given a talk, a longer talk uh, during our uh, uh, Platinum Jubilee uh, celebration, so. I was wondering what to talk about. Um, and there's something that I uh, hadn't mentioned in my earlier talk, uh, which was mainly focused on outflows. So this is uh, about an, uh, a new method, I think, uh, to study uh, what we call the circumgalactic medium. Uh, I think Manami has already talked about uh, the circumgalactic medium, but for the sake of those who uh, may not have been present there. Uh, so this is the gaseous medium it's a very dilute and tenuous medium uh, that surrounds the main optically visible part of the galaxy. So, so for example, this is what a galaxy looks like in optical. Uh, and uh, But surrounding it, uh, uh, one believes that there is a, a, a reservoir of uh, hot and tenuous gas filling up what is called the dark matter halo. You know that the you know, gravity of the galaxy is determined dictated mostly by dark matter, something that uh, doesn't shine. And dark matter extends far beyond the optical reaches of the galaxy, about 20 times, 10 times, 20 times the extent of the optical galaxy here. And this gas is supposed to, is believed to uh, fill up this dark matter halo. And it is, uh, if it is in virial temperature, one can uh, estimate the temperature of this gas that is supposed to be by the potential, depth of the potential well. And since we know the total mass and the size, you can uh, you expect that for Milky Way size, a Milky Way type galaxy is of the order of million degrees or so. But the gas density is very small. And, and why study circumgalactic medium? Because this is uh, supposed to be, although it's sort of invisible, it doesn't show uh, its uh, uh, existence um, uh, so uh, explicitly. But this is the stage, this is the arena where a lot of actions are happening. Uh, for example, when gas is ejected out of galaxies, the frame main part, due to various reasons, maybe there may be Asian activity, uh, black hole activity in the center, or due to star formation activity, when the stars uh, 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 end their lives by supernova explosions, they eject, uh, uh, they deposit a lot of energy in the interstellar medium, which may eject gas out of uh, the galaxy. Some of, a fraction of which may come back, which we call the recycled uh, gas by condensing cooling and condensing back. And there may be some gas being accreted out of what is what lies beyond the circumgalactic medium, which is the intergalactic medium, the, the gas be, between the galaxies. 
uh, we need all this because in order to uh, uh, sustain the uh, star formation uh, process in galaxies, um, it's very easy to see that you know if uh, the stars were to form without these activities, it would have uh, stopped uh, long ago. Anyway, so all this is happening in the circumgalactic medium and one wishes to know. Uh, but before going to all these details, first of all, one would like to know the how this gas is distributed. What is the uh, density distribution of, for example, even that is not well known. So how do we study? So this is one of the uh, uh, methods, for example. So this is another uh, uh, schematic diagram. So intergalactic medium lies beyond the galactic halo and this is the optical galaxy and this is uh, the circum circumgalactic medium. Now, uh, one way to look at the circumgalactic medium is to uh, look at some distant uh, bright source in the background uh, and see the line of sight when it crosses the circumgalactic medium, the ions which uh, uh, are present here, which will show up in the absorption line. Okay, and so you study the spectrum and from the absorption line, uh, you uh, can detect the different uh, ions and uh, study their uh, distribution. Uh, and this is very effective and this is the mainstay of uh, how we are, uh, one is studying. But there are other possibilities. For example, this gas is, is, is hot. Although it's low density makes it difficult to observe as I mentioned. So this is an idea how to, uh, uh, what are the typical densities involved. Um, and these are theoretical uh, modeling, uh, assuming various stuff which I will not get into. So for example, this is the density as a function of radius. It's a fractional radius of the virial radius. So to give you an idea, the virial radius for Milky Way type galaxies is of the order of 250 kiloparsecs, okay? So uh, as you can see the density, so uh, these are for Milky Way type and these are for a low mass galaxy. Okay. And this is the temperature, as I mentioned, this is of million degrees, low mass galaxies, uh, it, it can be uh, lower. So now, we would like to know the distribution of this uh, gas, right? So although the low density makes it difficult to observe, one can try, for example, the hot gas is going to emit X-rays and the X-ray emissivity uh, scales as N square T half because it's two body, it's, it's a Bremsstrahlen radiation, free free radiation. So it's basically radiated by electrons in when they're decelerated in the uh, presence of uh, ions. So it's a two body process that makes it N square and t to the power half because it's Bremsstrahlung. Now, why I'm mentioning all this in gory detail is as the n square factor makes it, it's a killing factor because of low density. If it is low density, n square makes it even lower, right? So X-ray is very difficult unless it's a very large galaxy which would make the temperature higher, which would make the density higher. And if it is, if it happens to be close by, then you can hope to uh, 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 detect this X-ray and it has been seen. For example, uh, this is a galaxy at, uh, at a distance of uh, 50 uh, megaparsecs, so it's about 150 million light years, okay. And the mass is huge. Uh, this is 10 to the power 13 solar mass, which makes it like uh, five times the total mass of Milky Way. So it's huge mass, but it's, but it's relatively close by. And this is what the galaxy looks like in uh, wave bands, like the near UV, uh, R band and uh, infrared K band. Uh, and this is what it looks like in X-rays. This is a Rosat uh, uh, map. They actually uh, uh, found this in the Rosat Old Sky map, which was taken a long time ago. Now, uh, this is not really clear. So they have done some manipulation of noise reduction, taken out uh, point uh, sources from here, and uh, and which then they claim that they have seen uh, the, the X-ray emission from uh, a large, uh, sort of uh, area, extended area around the galaxy can be seen. So this this is very difficult already and, and this is already bordering on uh, being doubtful or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but one can try this uh, for close by objects. What about other objects? So for other objects then you need to basically add the signals. You just keep stacking and then um, possibly some signal would show up. So this has, this was done. Uh, in uh, about 10 years ago. So you co-add, uh, maybe in different mass bands, so you, you select a sample and to be able to co-add, you have to uh, imagine some center so, so that you know the co-adding is proper. And, but the, uh, the disk of the galaxy, there are uh, X-ray sources in the disk of the galaxy, you have to cut that out. 
So you cut out a portion of, from the center about, um, which would correspond to about 10, 15 kiloparsecs for Milky Way type galaxies. You cut that out and you get that sort of signal. So different types of galaxies, they have stacked and you get some signal, okay? And they've done this for different mass beams, for example. So the same uh, uh, set of authors uh, in a later year. So this is the extra luminosity as a function of stellar mass. Now, which is also a proxy for the total mass. So Milky Way would uh, stand somewhere here. And let's not talk about, let's not worry about this part of the uh, uh, plot because the error bars are too large and it's not very clear what to infer from this. But here there's, a, uh, there's some trend. It seems to be, I mean, this is all stacking and different mass beams. Okay. Uh, so the thousands of galaxies have been stacked here. Now this gas also does another thing. This is uh, this hot gas, uh, because of its uh, temperature, it's also going to distort the, the spectrum of the microwave background. The microwave background photons, as you know, come, is pervades the whole universe and you, you see it from all directions. But if in the direction of the microwave background photon, uh, you have a region of hot gas, this hot gas electrons is going to do something which is completely opposite to Compton scattering. In Compton scattering, you have an X-ray photon hitting an electron and the X-ray photon changes its uh, frequency and the electron gets equal. But if, uh, if it so happens the electron is uh, high energetic and the photon is low energetic, then you can go to electron rest frame and then for that, it will look like a Compton scattering in its frame. So you can go to the frame of the uh, uh, electron and then come back to the lab frame. And what will happen, basically the low energy electron, uh, photon, will get boosted by the, uh, so the electron is going to lose energy and give the boost the energy of the uh, photon to high energy here. So, uh, which in, it is called the inverse Compton scattering and in the case of micro background scattering, uh, uh, cosmic micro background, this is called uh, Sunni Abzeldovich effect because they are the two uh, who predicted this, this is going to happen uh, almost like three, four years after the discovery of the uh, micro background. Um, and the magnitude of this distortion depends on the product of density of the electrons, temperature of the electrons, and the extent, the, the this size of the region uh, 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 through which the photons passes through. Right, this is the product of that. I mean, to be specific, uh, we call, uh, there's a parameter of a Y Compton parameter. Uh, it goes like this. It's the, this is the Thomson scattering because there's a cross section for the uh, Compton scattering here. And this is how uh, for example, a black body radiation is going to be distorted. So for a y value of say 0.15, this is a dimensionless parameter. It's basically, as you can see, this kT is energy divided by mc square is some sort of a fractional energy. And this is, uh, this is some sort of an optical depth, number of scattering that is happening, number of electrons, scattering, uh, uh, cross-section, and the length. Right? This is the number of scattering that is happening. So anyway, so this, uh, if y, say for example, of uh, uh, about uh, 0.15, the low energy photons, basically from the, this is the Rayleigh genes part of the uh, black body, is get shifted to the, the wings part. So that is how uh, uh, the distortions happen. And it's been seen in the case of clusters of galaxies. Clusters of galaxies are huge, as Surajit mentioned, like 10 to the power 15, 10 to the power 14 solar mass objects, like 100 to 1000 uh, uh, times the mass of the Milky Way. Okay? And they, these uh, structures, they contain a huge amount of gas, also at a very high temperature, 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 uh, degrees. So, which makes the, the Y parameter very large. Very large means 10 to the power minus 5 or so, okay. Uh, but that has been seen in the case of clusters. For example, this is a case, uh, a cluster called Abel uh, 2317. And you can see that this is a, uh, there's a prediction on how the spectrum is going to look like. In really Jean's part, if you look, then this is the CMB sky. You will see a hole in the CMB sky. Right, uh, intensity is being taken out from here and it's been added in the wind spot. It will look like a bright spot. And around two th uh, 217, this is where uh, this is won't be any distortion. But, well, I mean, this has been seen in the case of clusters. In the CGM is also going to do that, although the Y parameter is going to be very, very small, much smaller than the case of clusters. So it's going to be difficult to observe. But one can again stack and Planck uh, collaboration that have, they have actually stacked this. Again, in for different mass beams, this is again, uh, uh, this is stellar mass. 
So uh, Milky Way will come here, but let's not worry about this part of the figure. Again, the error bars are very large, but there is a there is a trend here. One can start talking about uh, uh, what's uh, what's the CGM like here. So uh, these two effects, uh, the the X-ray, for example, goes as n squared t to the power half, and this Sonia Zeldovich effect goes as n times t. So there are two different types of dependencies on density and temperature. So, I mean, this idea is not new. It's been used in the case of clusters. You use these two different uh, dependencies to distinguish between different models, and you can, uh, you can, for example, uh, measure the Hubble constant through that. But in the case of, uh, say it again. Uh, I forgot this. What the insert is? Okay, this is uh, not really y parameter. This is the Planck's uh, definition of. of I'm not going to the technical details. Uh, is some cylindrical average over uh, y500 any but this is related to the y parameter anyway so what we thought is try out two different distributions of uh, density distributions and see if we can distinguish between them by looking both uh, looking at both x-ray and sz analysis so for example if we if the density in the circumgalactic medium is distributed in two different manner. Uh, we uh, this is what we call the hydro, and this is called what we call the beta model. And we took uh, this is R, uh, how it's going at uh, uh, you know scaling is r, so beta of 0.4. And as you can see, uh, these are the data points uh, of the same paper that I have shown you. And this is the Sunev Zeldovich. Um, Sunev Zeldovich uh, 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 signals are not so um, uh, uh, strongly dependent on the distribution. Uh, because it's a, it's a integrated part of, of the of the pressure, uh, but uh, one can distinguish between t these two models uh, looking at the X-ray. So the idea is that, and, and this has been taken uh, further in a recent paper by Kimetal, who have uh, even uh, tried to implement a, a different feedback process if there is an agent black hole activity or not black hole uh, black uh, or, or star formation activity which might disturb this circumgalactic medium and change the sunyev zeldovich signals. And this is their uh, um, simulation. Uh, this is what the, the, the blue part is where the Planck uh, data exists. And the, 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 the blue uh, stars is what they call the no AGN. And the yellow stars is something to do with the star formation activity. So anyway, they're trying to make the point that Studying this sunev zeldovich distortion from CGM, even from stack signals, it might be possible to say something about what is happening in the circumgalactic medium and from the disk. Are there any black hole activity? Are there any star formation activity, ejections, etc.? And if we if we cross correlate with the X-ray signals, maybe in the near future uh, we might be able to say uh, more about the uh, the circumgalactic medium. And it's come to zero, so I'll stop here. Thanks. Questions? No, I think it's very fundamental because uh, you mentioned that the gas are hot. Because I had a feeling that it should be cold. As you go away from the, our uh, distance far away, it should be cold. Why? What makes this gas hot? Uh, that's a good oh, what? Okay, one idea is that it's the virial. Is the gas that is reminiscent of, you know, when the galaxy formed, right? So the baryons, the gas fell into the potential wells. And so we expect that the temperature would reflect on the depth of the potential well, just from the virial equilibrium. So M over R, GM over R will be roughly correspond to KT. That means particularly when the gas is condensed and localizedly the temperature is higher, but in between the temperature is uh, different. So the temperature will cool down if the gas remains like this, see there won't be any galaxy. So some of this gas cools down, okay? If, uh, if it can uh, cool before it can collapse, okay? So, and then it will be able to form stars. So a certain fraction of this gas is going to form stars in the disk. But most of this, maybe most, uh, 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 some fraction of this gas is going to be left behind this, uh, in the star formation process and will, be, will remain basically keep uh, 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 hot by the, by the gravity by the potential well of the gravity, which turns out to be of the order of million degrees in Milky Way. If you to be able to, to be able to form, uh, to be able to cool, you need to form clouds. 
Otherwise, the because the cooling also goes as n square. Okay, so the cooling will become important for large density gas. So you need to form. So they need to form clouds, and then they might form. They might cool down, and then in a form come to the center. Uh, yeah, very nice talk. Thanks. <clears throat> so I have a question that what kind of uh, like. Uh, Sensitivities do you need from X-ray instruments to get this kind of measurement? Because I think current systems, they can't isolate the galaxies very well, very far galaxies. So what kind of additional capabilities do you need from the X-ray instruments to you know do this kind yeah, of study? more sensitivity. Okay. Just uh, uh, simply sensitivity yeah, one is not angular about, resolution. Yeah, one is not really talking about spectrum here, but just the uh, sensitivity okay. um, and, and the ang angular resolution. Yeah, okay. To be able to cut out the uh, ah, the yeah, sources, correct. Yes, sources. bright sources also you need. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. We have SZ clustered uh, samples from other experiments, PMP experiments, at uh, smallest. Other than Planck. Oh, yeah. For this mass, not that I know of. Okay. For this mass range, I, I think see. people. There are people who are trying to uh, build individual telescope uh, 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 on ground. Mm -hmm. to be able to detect SZ. I mean, this is 10% of micro Kelvin. Okay. So, uh, typically. I don't know how they, uh, difficult or uh, easy that is. Then let's thank Biman again for such a nice Thanks. talk. Welcome all uh, to uh, second session of the final day of uh, in-house 2023. Uh, the first speaker of this session is Tanuman Ghosh from Astrophysics. Let's welcome Tanuman. Okay, hi, I'm um, Tanuman Ghosh. Uh, so uh, today I'll be discussing about spectral cutoff in ULXS and its origin. Uh, so before going to all the details of uh, the uh, formal uh, subject of spectral cutoff in ULXS and what is the physical motivation or physical uh, possible origin uh, of this uh, spectral cutoffs. Let's uh, start with some uh, brief introduction of what are these ULX objects. So, uh, so in astrophysics, we know uh, this Eddington limit uh, where a star, uh, when it's in hydrostatic equilibrium, uh, that means the inward gravitational pressure is balanced by the outward radiation pressure. The star is in hydrostatic equilibrium. And uh, on, uh, during that situation, uh, the star can attain the highest possible luminosity, which is called Eddington luminosity. So if you assume uh, spherical symmetry and purely ionized hydrogen and uh, the dominant scattering mechanism as Thomson scattering mechanism, then the Eddington limit will be uh, of this form where the capital M is the mass of the compact object. So it will be the accretor mass. So let's say you put uh, one solar mass, uh, so M capital M equals to one solar mass, then L Eddington will be around uh, 10 to the power 38 arc per second. Now, so there is a broad, broad definition uh, where some sources which are found mostly in outer galaxies, not in Milky Way, and those sources which are not in the center of the galaxies, that means not supermassive black holes, they uh, sometimes uh, uh, exhibit a luminosity more than the Eddington luminosity of a 10 solar mass black hole, that means around 10 to the power 39 arc per second or more. Those sources are called ultraluminous excess sources. Now, why uh, these ULXs are important? So we can uh, have a schematic diagram of luminosity. So let's say in the left hand side, we have 10 to the 38 arc per second or less. This is mostly dominated by the X-ray binary systems in our galaxy, mostly black hole binaries or neutron star binaries. Their mass of these objects are around 1 to 10, 15 solar mass. So Le uh, t less than 10 to the 38 arc per second luminosity is within the Eddington limit of that of those masses, right? And in the extreme right of uh, this uh, diagram, uh, you have this luminosity of 10 to the 43 or more arc per second. So 46, 47, it can go. But here also, uh, the luminosity uh, is such that the mass of the objects uh, are very massive, like 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 7, 8 solar mass. So that uh, the accretion process uh, of these objects are also within the Eddington limit, so sub-Eddington accretion. The most interesting part comes from here, where 10 to the 39 to 10 to the 42 arc per second. So there, are, there can be one scenario where uh, some low luminosity AGNs can have such luminosity, 10 to the 39 to 42 arc per second. But those are located at the center of the galaxies. So we are not discussing those sources. 
we are discussing the sources which are not at the nucleus of the galaxies, but still exhibiting uh, such high luminosity. Those are known as ULXs or sometimes hyperluminous X sources like very, uh, very high luminosity. And uh, interesting part is that uh, there are two possibilities. So, one is let us say you have a, a massive black hole of 100 solar mass or 1000 solar mass then you can easily attain this luminosity within the Eddington accretion rate, right? Sub Eddington accretion on intermediate mass black hole can give such uh, high luminosity. Another possibility is that the objects are stellar mass objects like stellar mass black holes or neutron stars, but uh, their accretion process is quite uh, drastically different, which is super Eddington accretion, thus giving uh, such high luminosity. Now, it was initially assumed, but uh, what happened? In 2014, uh, there is the first discovery of neutron star ULX. So, one ULX was confirmed to be hosting a neutron star. That means, super Eddington accretion on neutron star with a luminosity of 10 to the 40, 41 arc per second is feasible. And after that, like 6 or 7 uh, neutron star ULXs have been uh, discovered with one ULX is showing no pulsation but a cyclotron absorption line. Uh, so, so far like 7 neutron star ULXs have been confirmed. Now, the question is uh, how many ULXs are neutron stars? or are there sources which are not neutron stars, but stellar mass black holes or intermediate mass black holes. Uh, one interesting feature of ULX spectra when we study them is that most ULXs show a distinct spectral curvature around 6 to 10 keV. Okay, if you see the uh, spectra of hard state black hole binary or active galactic nuclei, like the second panel is what around 1 to 10 solar mass black hole this is like billion solar mass black hole then million million to billion solar mass black hole but most of them has a very hard spectrum but for ulx most of the ulxs which have been observed in broadband data have been shown i mean exhibited to uh, this uh, spectral uh, like uh, spectral curvature around 6 to 10 kV. and people used to think that this can be one uh, you know distinct feature which can say that these ULXs are not going through sub Eddington accretion process just like black hole binaries or AGNs. They, uh, this is a signature of super Eddington accretion. Now, what uh, we find in the literature that uh, in the broadband uh, spectra of ULXs are modeled with two thermal components along with a high energy cutoff component. Okay, but this cutoff component often used as a phenomenological component like cutoff power law or so. But so far in the literature, there is no concrete theoretical model which can explain such a, a like a generic origin of such spectral cutoff in most of the ULXs. Like most of the ULXs are showing a uh, cutoff at same energy range. So it is expected that or we can expect that uh, it is coming from a common origin. So what uh, we did is like we uh, developed a theoretical model, fully theoretical model, which can explain such a spectral cutoff on the basis of a synchrotron radiation principle. So, synchrotron radiation we know that uh, there is a magnetic field in the z axis, uh, electron or any particle charged particle moving around the x y plane, a photon is emitted uh, in a, a certain angle. Okay? So, this is the intensity uh, given uh, in this direction of the emitted photons. Okay? So, what we found is that if we just plot uh, this equation, the intensity or the spectra uh, equation, uh, so at theta equals to 0 degree, which is usual uh, standard synchrotron uh, mechanism we study in our textbooks that theta equals to, so basically it is ultra relativistic uh, electrons giving synchrotron radiation at the plane of the orbit, uh, along the plane of the orbit, then theta x is 0 degree. So, this will be a typical spectra which we usually know. Okay? But uh, let us say we have a magnetic field of 10 to the 12 Gauss for neutron stars. Then for gamma, so relativistic boost, let us say 10 to the 6 or 7 order, then what will happen the spectral cutoff gamma cube omega b, which is a synchronous spectral cutoff typically, will go to gamma rays like GV or TV energy range. It will not give us cutoff at extra energy range. Okay? But uh, what we found is that if theta is not 0 degree, that means if uh, the electrons or the particles are not extremely relativistic, slightly less relativistic and the uh, photons are emitting at a certain latitude angle, this latitude will dictate where the cutoff will happen. For example, uh, the if you uh, like increase the angle, like the increase the latitude, the cutoff will decrease, like the uh, cutoff will happen at a lower harmonic. Okay? So, 
for a fixed gamma and fixed magnetic field, only a change in latitude in of the emitted photons will uh, shift the cutoff, spectral cutoff and give it in X-ray uh, spectral cutoff. And this all comes from the Bessel function like Jn and Jn prime, uh, this uh, property. How is it so? If we uh, do a stationary phase approximation of uh, these Bessel functions, we will find that after a certain uh, harmonic, uh, which we define as Nc, before that Nc, the spectra will look like a increasing function uh, with n. But uh, so it will just, uh, you have to multiply by n square to uh, get the spectra also. But uh, this after Nc, uh, you will have an exponential cutoff. Uh, in the Bessel function itself that is actually creating the uh, spectral cutoff in the, uh, I mean uh, received spectra. And this cutoff will depend on the beta prime, uh, which is basically the relativistic, uh, like the velocity of the particles beta and uh, the inclination angle of the emitted photons cos theta, okay. And uh, we know uh, again, like if you put uh, just beta equals to 1, uh, basically ultra relativistic limit and theta equals to 0, which we know from the standard textbook this form will just go to gamma cube, which we know uh, like gamma cube omega b, okay. And uh, then our question is whether this latitude and the velocity of the particles can be any value or uh, like it has some restriction. The restriction is that this nc, which is a harmonic, has to be greater than equals to 1, right? This is a harmonic, so 1, 2, 3, 4. So it has to be greater than equals to 1. Actually in for continuum uh, synchrotron emission, it has to be very large uh, compared to 1. And if you constrain, uh, if you solve this equation, you will get that both beta and cos theta, this beta cos theta term, will be within the range of 0.3 to 1. So theta will be uh, restricted within 0 degree to 70 degree max. So nothing, uh, no continuum emission will come from above 70 degree, okay. And uh, same case for beta, uh, beta less than 0.3 will not give you any com uh, continuum emission. So, uh, Okay, so these are the basics uh, of this uh, theoretical model, which shows where the cutoff will happen. Now we'll test this model with a real observed data. So what we did is uh, we took two uh, well-known pulsars, uh, pulsar ULXs, which are very bright and uh, good uh, S by uh, signal to noise ratio in the hard energy range. And uh, what we found is that uh, within five to 25 keV, the spectra looks same, the spectral shapes are similar, only there is a difference uh, between flux in different observation time, like uh, today it was observed, then one year later it was observed, only the flux level changed uh, between this 5 to 25 keV, but overall the spectral shape remains the uh, same. That will, uh, we will discuss what is the implication uh, with this. And uh, we used 5 to 25 keV just to avoid any uh, contamination from the soft energy component like disk or any absorption which is dominant in the soft energy range. And then uh, this is the, this, word, this was the uh, single electron spectrum as we already discussed. Now in reality, there is no only one single electron, it has to be a distribution of electrons with the distribution of velocities. So what we did is we convolute uh, this single electron spectrum, this one, with a cutoff power law distribution of the electrons itself. And Fortunately or unfortunately, uh, this new B contains this omega uh, E B by gamma M C. So B and gamma are coupled together, okay. It cannot be uh, separately measured or separately fitted as a parameter. So we define it as a single parameter X, which is gamma by B. And we, uh, then we uh, convolute the model with a free parameter of normalization and free parameter of X, gamma by B. And we uh, fitted uh, the real observed data from new star for these two sources with uh, for, for different angles, okay, cause 1 degree, 2 degree, 10 degree, uh, 30 degree or so. Here I am uh, showing like 1 degree here and this is 30 degree. So like two example we are just showing. So the point is that both 1 degree, 30 degree, 15 degree, these are like theoretically degenerate. You cannot uh, distinguish this model just by uh, increasing the signal noise ratio of the data. They are like overlapping even theoretically. So then what we found uh, from the fitting, spectral fitting, we found that when uh, the emission is close to the orbital plane of the electrons, so low latitude basically one degree or so, then uh, X min, uh, this parameter will become around 10 to the minus 7 to minus 6. And 
for a typical neutron star magnetic field 10 to the power 12 gauss, we will get very high gamma relativistic boost 10 to the power 5, 10 to the power 6 order. But same case when it happens for a high latitude emission 30 degree let us say for example, the x min will be 10 to the power minus 11. For the same magnetic field, the plasma has to be semi relativistic 10 to, the, uh, 10 to 20 around. So, the interesting thing is that uh, when latitude is increasing, the plasma has to be semi, I mean, uh, semi relativistic, not highly relativistic, to give you the same spectral shape or spectral curvature at in x rays. Okay? And uh, the another parameter was the normalization, which is basically related to the number of the particles. And uh, what we estimated a typical number density for these two sources is around uh, or more than the Goldrick Julian limit in the neutron star, which is expected like uh, the minimum, this is the minimum uh, limit, the number limit of the number density of the, okay. Uh, yeah, so minimum uh, number density of the particles. Okay, and uh, what we found that it can, it will depend on the estimated volume, what, uh, where the emission region is and what is the volume of the emission region. So, it can also support the superintendent accretion that it is more than the typical Goldrick Julian limit. So, more material is coming from superintendent accretion, but the, the cutoff is happening due to synchrotron emission from the emitting region. And we also estimated that the uh, system is optically thin, so uh, in, uh, in terms of synchrotron self-absorption. So, to summarize uh, the work is that the spectral cutoff in evil excess arise from a classical high latitude and optically thin synchrotron radiation. And wha what uh, this theoretical model is different from standard synchrotron uh, radiation in like uh, in textbooks, which is that conventionally we know the cutoff happens is gamma cube uh, omega b or nu b, but with high latitude angle the uh, cutoff will shift to a lower energies in x rays perhaps. Uh, depending on the emission angle. And one distinguishing feature is that for higher uh, latitude angle for 30, for 30 degrees for example, we will get this omega b, b by gamma m c will be around 600 eV which is close to new, uh, new star uh, spectral resolution. So, new star will detect it as uh, discrete lines not as a continuum. But uh, it is also difficult to assert like that because there will be combination of gamma from the distribution of gamma itself, right. The uh, different particles have different gamma, so it will be mixing up. But one uh, can probe uh, what latitude it is coming from. So, most likely it can come from lower latitude angles, so that it will give easily a continuum spectra. And another possible probe is that if it is possible by polar uh, polarimetry measurement by uh, ISP or exposed at uh, polyx, uh, that distinguishing between the linear polarization or electrically polarization which will come in different angles. So, what we found uh, from uh, this, our analysis from these values that typically all these evil excess which show spectral cutoff, if the synchrotron radiation is explaining the spectral cutoff uh, as physical uh, scenario, then the most of the sources will be neutron stars. Because the value of x min will not allow it to go very low magnetic field, it has to be around at least 10 to the power 7, 8 Gauss magnetic field, which is a typical lower limit of neutron stars uh, magnetic field in accreting uh, binary systems. So, yeah, so thank you. Let us have some quick questions. Are there any questions? What, what was n in your model? Ah, n is the, so overall normalization factor here? No, 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 the small n before. Uh, small in n. In your model. Yeah. This, this yeah, yeah, yeah. Small is, uh, small is not the parameter, it is just uh, saying the harmonic. So, n is basically omega by omega so b. And it's related to the, I mean, the energy level of the energy level of the uh, like radiation. Yeah. Uh, okay. And uh, you said that these tails were exponential for power law or something, right? Uh, which one? The, the, the tails here were power laws or something. Were power laws, the cutoff was yes, a power yes, law cutoff. Cut cut but uh -huh. your uh, asymptotes show that it is uh, exponential, right? This Bessel, Bessel function uh, No, no, this asymptotes. is exponentially cutoff, right? Right, but it's so it's exponential cutoff, not a power law. It's an exponential cutoff. Power law will also see this is just the term which is coming from the Bessel function. To get the total spectra, you also have to multiply by n square. So there will be another power law with uh, n, right? So there is outside n to a minus half. If you multiply, there will be another some power law. And no, like, but there is an exponential uh, that, that will dominate, right? It to the power minus n something so that will always yes, dominate. Yes, yes. So the, basically, the thing is that. Exponential, so exponential cutoff power law, what is that? 
power law e to the power minus alpha and then but that's anyway for n large yes n so greater n, than n greater than nc so where the cutoff is happening let's say cutoff is happening here or somewhere here so after that this will dominate before that it will just rising right okay right so basically it's an exponential cutoff and yes. uh, you see the power law somewhere before that so total uh, the total spectra is basically exponential cutoff power law yeah uh, this neutron stars okay so what yeah what we found is that from the analysis uh, we found typical values of x min which is basically gamma min by b right the parameter is around 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 11 depending on the latitude okay realistic latitude so let's say you take 10 to the minus 7 and uh, what can be the minimum magnetic field possible magnetic field it has to be 10 to the minus 7 gauss right because gamma cannot be less than 1 so gamma by b if it is 10 to the minus 7 then 10 to the uh, b is 10 to the 7 and gamma is 1 that is the extreme scenario so typically magnetic field will be higher than that so 10 to the 8 9 gauss for in this case high, high latitude 10 to the minus 11 so it will never reach the magnetic field will never be less than 10 to the 11 gauss for this case right so in most of the cases for all angles we are finding that the magnetic field is compatible with neutron star magnetic field so if this model is expanding ULX cutoff, then most of the ULXs will be neutron stars. Uh, very nice talk. And so what I wanted to ask is from this cutoff value, can you further comment on with about the mass characteristics of the new, or like whatever, it, whether it's uh, like ULX can be either uh, like stellar mass object having super Eddington or a little more massive like tens of solar mass having sub Eddington accretion. Yes. Can you comment on the type of accretion and the type of object based on this cutoff value or your model? Yeah. So let's say if you consider this model is to be the correct one which okay. is explaining the spectral cutoff then as i said like it will go to uh, neutron star systems only right due to the magnetic field so neutron star typical mass is 1 to 3 solar mass max and about accretion the super Eddington or sub Eddington on uh, neutron stars that will depend uh, on various scenario so first of all uh, we have not uh, performed a broadband analysis with the soft energy component as well as the hard energy component but let's say uh, the hard energy component is giving us number density which is more than the golden Julian limit which is typical uh, plasma density okay and then if you uh, it depends on the emitting region the volume of the emitting region also so if you have more number density it is expected that the particles are coming from somewhere right mm. so it is it might be coming from a super Indian accretion so more matter is being accreted and the matter is falling on the pole and that is basically giving you the emission. And how do you spectrally calculate this normalization value from the uh, normalization of the power law? Or is yes, it so basically we fit this new FQ to the data. Okay. Uh, N prime is basically N somewhere and N is uh, related to by rho N V by mm -hmm. D square. Okay, rho N is the number density. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Once again, thank, uh, let's thank Tanuman. Okay. Uh, the The second speaker of this session is Abhishek from SEM. Let's welcome Abhishek. Uh, thanks, Vishnu. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity. And uh, as the title suggests, I'll be discussing on uh, origin of steady state stress fluctuation in a sphere thinning worm like micellar solution. So, uh, these are uh, the outline of the talk. And uh, first of all, I'll give an introduction and what are the steady state uh, rheological response different elasticity driven instabilities those are happening in those systems and uh, what are the spatio temporal nature of such fluctuations and uh, then with that i'll conclude so uh, i would like to introduce to womb like myself that uh, these womb like myself are nothing but uh, the self assembled structure uh, uh, coming from uh, amphiphilic molecules uh, when you put them in water so uh, a typical amphiphilic molecule has a hydrophilic head which is polar in nature and that likes to stay uh, with water and the other part is the hydrophobic tail, which is a, you know, I will call that as uh, call also oil that stays away from the water. When you put uh, such molecules in water, uh, they uh, beyond certain concentration, they form this kind of aggregate, uh, a cylindrical aggregate, we call also womb like aggregate, and uh, uh, hence they form womb like micelle. Uh, when we increase the uh, concentration of such amphiphilic molecules in water, the number of these aggregates increase and they eventually they get entangled. So this particular entangled room like micellar solution has a different uh, industrial application. So uh, they are used uh, as a drag reducer in turbulent industry, uh, uh, drag reducer uh, in pipeline industry uh, to uh, reduce the turbulence and uh, cosmetic industry such as shampoos and all they are using uh, 
they are uh, used and uh, uh, to transport uh, particulate suspension they are also used uh, and uh, such applications uh, uh, they involve various non-linear flows such as elastic turbulence, rio chaos, shear thinning and such flows happen at significantly uh, low value of Reynolds number. So and also uh, this kind of flows uh, uh, usually shows uh, uh, stress fluctuation in the system. Now, uh, uh, two eight percent CTAT and hundred millimolar sodium chloride. It's, it's a special. It's a uh, very different ohm like micelle, uh, which has been studied. Uh, 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 that that is a, you know uh, is a model system for understanding uh, different nonlinear flows. Uh, where the there is a stress fluctuation, but uh, the origin of such stress fluctuation with a microscopic insight is still not well understood. So here we would like to address the question uh, uh, by using uh, experimental techniques such as rheology and in situ boundary imaging. Um, uh, so uh, first of all, uh, for the rheological setup, we have used a spin drive rheometer with a Taylor quid geometry. So Taylor quid geometry basically. It's a concentric cylinder geometry and in the gap we put the sample and then we do uh, shearing and uh, we do the rest uh, and we see the response of the sample. So here uh, is a typical flow curve for a uh, for the system that I showed at uh, 208 percent CTAT and 100 millimolar sodium chloride. So here in the x axis we have Weisenberg number and in the y axis we have normalized shear stress. So in the in the x axis that Weisenberg number it consists of a shear rate and a tau m. So shear rate uh, is uh, connects to the rotational uh, motion of the inner cylinder and the stress that we are measuring from the rheometer drive. And uh, this tau m and g naught uh, they are used uh, for as a normalization constant and they uh, those parameters we obtain from the uh, frequency sweep measurement in the linear viscoelastic response. But uh, and also if you look at the flow curve there is a clear change in the slope so which suggests the system is a shear thinning material. Now. Uh, 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 in this flow curve, we have identified three different regions. Uh, one uh, is uh, uh, until uh, Weisenberg number one. Another is the intermediate region between one and fifteen. The other one is beyond fifteen. So when we look at the stress response at a particular imposed Weisenberg number, we see that uh, uh, for Weisenberg number beyond fifteen, we see large fluctuation, whereas uh, below. Uh, let's say the second region or the first region, we did not see any significant fluctuation of the shear stress. So this fluctuation we further quantify uh, in terms of the standard deviation and uh, clearly also the standard deviation suggests that uh, the large fluctuation that we see are happening in the third region uh, beyond Weisenberg number of 15, but there is a mild uh, increase in fluctuation in the second region. So now again I would like to uh, put the question that uh, what is the origin of this stress fluctuation. So to understand them, we do in situ boundary imaging at different different shear planes of the Taylor quid geometry. So now uh, um, uh, this is a uh, typical uh, Taylor quid geometry, the cylinders that you see, and here we are interested to image the flow gradient plane. But uh, before that, uh, I would like to show that uh, uh, so the theta direction for the cylindrical coordinate system that is the flow. The radially outward direction is the flow gradient and along the height of the cylinder is the vorticity direction. So here we are interested in the flow gradient direction that is uh, basically we are interested to imaging from the top and this is the typical uh, picture of the imaging setup and uh, the interest uh, the plane of interest and the Taylor quid geometry that you are using uh, the gap is 1 mm and uh, the shearing profile uh, the shearing uh, type we are using we are using a counter rotation mode. That means we have two different geometries, uh, inner cylinder and outer cylinder, and both the cylinders are rotating in a counterclockwise manner. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, this micellar solution that we are using is transparent in nature. So uh, to look at the flow field, we have used polystyrene tracer particle uh, as a tracer, and we map out the velocity profile. Now uh, this is a typical snapshot of the raw image that we obtain from the flow gradient plane imaging, and uh, with this. Here you can see the outer cylinder is rotating, uh, moving in this direction and inner cylinder is the opposite direction. And we uh, do particle imaging velocimetry and uh, 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 analysis and we map out the velocity profile. And uh, for two different Weisenberg number for 0.1 and 8, uh, uh, we could see that uh, you know the velocity profile is linear 
and here clearly uh, i have uh, in the x axis there is d by d is the normalized gap and in the y axis there, there is v by v not so the uh, gap is normalized with the constant uh, d of 1 mm and the v not is the velocity of either of the inner and outer cylinder clearly uh, uh, it is uh, there is a clear distinction between point 1 and 8 so uh, point uh, weisenberg number 8 which is in the uh, first non linear second region so there we could see this uh, uh, fluctuation of velocity profile so to further understand them we uh, quantify the following quantity which is the velocity gradient so for a linear behavior this velocity gradient is nothing but the slope of the velocity profile so uh, when we uh, so for a linear behavior such gradient value will be uh, minus 2 but uh, but if there is some fluctuation it will be different from minus 2 so now we plot the spatio temporal distribution of the velocity gradient and it is clearly evident that uh, 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 for, in, uh, for point 1 in the linear first region we don't see any kind of uh, spatial temporal distribution of gradient but when you go to 8 we see uh, uh, there is a spatial temporal distribution of gradient and uh, uh, in this region we see a mild stress fluctuation but we still uh, would like to understand uh, what is the what is happening in the other region then uh, we do the imaging in the uh, following plane we do imaging at flow vorticity plane so in this plane uh, the theta and the along the cylinder height uh, we are imaging and here uh, to visualize the flow field again the micellar solution is transparent to look at the flow patterns we use anisotropic mica particle so these particles can orient according to the flow if there is some secondary flow it will give an enhanced reflection so uh, now uh, uh, the same uh, so uh, now the typical image we observe at this particular frame uh, is the same for both region 1 and region 2 so until weisenberg number of 15 we did not see any kind of you know secondary flow or uh, uh, flow pattern but the moment we went to uh, weisenberg number beyond 15 we could see that there is uh, unsteady teller vortex flow happening in the system so clearly in this region we see the fluctuation now we would like to further understand uh, what is the uh, what is exactly happening so to understand further we quanti uh, we analyze these uh, images in terms of uh, uh, their uh, Spatio temporal nature. So, we, take a, we, take a, we took a vertical cut and we stack them with respect to time, then we get a spatio temporal distribution of intensity. And clearly, you can see that uh, you know in this uh, first region on, and in the second region, we do not see any kind of spatio temporal nature. But beyond uh, Weisenberg number 15, which is the third region, we could see there are uh, significant spatio temporal nature. So, then we further quantify this spatio temporal nature in terms of the power distribution then we could see that the power decays at f raise to minus 2 and k raise to minus 2. So now we took a further uh, 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 look into such uh, images at uh, uh, you know higher frame rate of camera then we could see there are uh, there are a continuous reorganization of large scale structures those are happening in the system. Now to further understand this kind of uh, uh, reorganization of large scale structure we again went back to uh, the imaging in flow gradient plane that is the imaging from the top and we could see that uh, uh, the sample is undergoing a stick slip kind of motion so where part of the sample is moving with a velocity much much higher than the velocity of the rotating cylinder so it's a elastic uh, recoiling sort of event and uh, again we do the velocity mapping the following way this is the velocity profile uh, for a typical uh, stick slip event and uh, as you can see the velocity is quite higher and uh, such event uh, usually occurs for uh, 75 milliseconds so here uh, uh, with this we, i can uh, we can tell that you know uh, the uh, shear induced breakage and reorganization those are happening due to shear uh, they are responsible for the last scale stru uh, stress fluctuation whereas this uh, gradient fluctuation in the velocity from the top uh, from the flow gradient plane imaging they were responsible for the mild increase of uh, mild increase of standard deviation and they, they don't give any significant stress fluctuation so now also we further image the other plane which is the gradient vorticity plane with a laser sheet and uh, clearly we could see uh, beyond weisenberg number 15 that uh, the scattering intensity was spatio temporally varying whereas uh, in weisenberg number uh, in the first region we did not see any kind of uh, scattering but in, in intermediate region we could see some scattering but they were uh, not changing with respect to time now with this uh, uh, 
I would like to conclude with the following picture. Uh, but uh, before that, I would like to acknowledge uh, my supervisor, Dr. Sainthan, uh, my collaborator, uh, Pradeep, and these are uh, the lab members. And, and I would like to thank RRI Workshop for helping me uh, design those imaging setups. And with that, I would like to thank all of you. And uh, I would like to take question while the conclusion is still on. So when you were imaging from the flow vorticity plane, yeah. flow, uh, flow gradient plane, you okay. saw that at some part the sample moves faster than the um, plate yes. velocity. So can it be a precursor of elastic turbulence in that system? Uh, uh, so elastic turbulence is happening because of such events. So uh, uh, yeah, so in elastic turbulence we see such events. So precursor of elastic events will be, you know, those events will happen intermittently. They will not happen, you know, there will not be any sustained uh, events that are happening in the system. Yeah, in your first slide, you showed this uh, micellar network or something, yeah, right? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, if somebody wants to model that network, do you know what kind of interactions one might one might use between the yeah, filaments? Yeah, so and uh, usually, uh, you know, uh, this micelles that they, they form, uh, there were this hydrophobic interaction and entropic term. So these two, you know, they always, uh, there is a competition between entropy and the inter uh, hydrophobic interaction and from there uh, you form a micelle. But if you talk about the modeling of the flow profile and the nature of the flow of these micelles, uh, there are uh, there are several models. No, I'm talking about the network only. Okay. And uh, uh, I mean, have people looked at like in experiments, like, uh, I mean, usually they put this uh, tracer bead and so on in a. Yeah. So have they looked at uh, things like that in uh, these micellar networks? Yeah, yeah, there has been uh, many yes. studies where. Uh, so they, they, yeah, because this this kind of uh, solutions are very transparent. So in order to have a flow field, uh, you have to have some tracer. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I, I I saw that there is some velocity as a function of. Uh, yeah. So this last. Uh, picture the sustained stick slip type motion yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, so you are meaning that at the uh, inner plate i think there is a velocity v naught yeah and in between some large velocity and then again goes yes, yes. so uh, so there is some kind of asymmetry uh, so i thought this is v and minus v yeah so so, uh, uh, so also <laughs> during this event uh, so the sample also was not in contact with the uh, outer cylinder so, so it, it, it uh, so there are certain instances it will be in contact, but there are certain instances it will not be in contact with the outer cylinder. But still, there will be a drive coming from the inner cylinder of the uh, quad geometry, okay. and which can also give rise to this kind of fluctuation. Okay. Hi. Uh, very nice talk, yeah. Abhishek. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I wanted to ask, uh, what is this uh, Weizenberg number? Yeah. So, uh, so Weizenberg number is some quantity. Always we. Uh, you know, when there is elasticity in the system, so we talk in terms of Weizenberg number. So in my case, uh, when I spoke about Weizenberg number, uh, so essentially it is a shear rate, which the rotational shear that I'm applying, but I have added, I have multiplied with one constant quantity, which is a tau m. Okay, so that tau m is a constant quantity, which is a material property. But the, the shear rate is essentially, you know, a Weizenberg number. When you say you are increasing your Weizenberg number, basically I am rotating more and more, and I'm uh, my system is giving material property and whatever. Yeah. What is the order as it, as it uncertainty on the number fifteen? Okay, so uh, well, uh, so number fifteen is not essentially very, you know, a special number or something. So it, it's a, you know, it's a property of the system, and this number. This crossover number can also vary from system to system. So there is nothing uh, really special with uh, the number. So uh, so one, one thing is uh, this number can vary if you change your temperature a bit. So this kind of uh, solutions are uh, extremely sensitive to temperature. So uh, yeah, they will vary, but uh, yeah, there are uh, it will be like you know either uh, it will be 15 or 16. So so in between that they vary. They don't vary much unless you change the temperature. Uh, yeah. Very uh, naive question. That, uh, answer your question. Yeah. Okay, I have one question. Yeah. Uh, it's very naive question. In the first slide, you mentioned about some elastic turbulence yeah. at lower Reynolds number. Yeah. Uh, 
So usually in uh, fluids, uh, the turbulence happens at high Reynolds number, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah. is it due to the entanglement of the... Um, uh, yeah, so uh, usually conventional turbulence when you talk about, that happens due to inertia. So you, let's say you take water and uh, you know you rotate. So uh, the inertial effects will come and they will give you turbulence. But, but at that particular scenario, the Reynolds number will be significantly higher. But here in this case, if you calculate the Reynolds number, they will be significantly lower because the solution has higher viscosity, and uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, the elasticity also is in the picture. That's why uh, this is a turbulence which is uh, coming into the picture, but the, where the Reynolds number is small and the elasticity number, you know, elasticity is uh, more dominant in that case. That is why this this is some some turbulence which is dominated by purely elasticity. Yeah. Abhishek. So, uh, can you please go to the next slide? I mean, where you have shown. Yeah. So, the Weisenberg number you have taken, uh, I think the maximum is 22 or something. Maximum is uh, 40. 40, yeah. So, is there any limit? I mean, till the um, this number you can go. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, there are uh, certain, you know, uh, experimental limitations that I would say or some material property. So, when you shear more and more, then uh, this normal stress effects also come into the picture. Then part of the sample will come out of the cylinder. So then uh, that is not a reliable rheological measurement as well. So that is why we have restric restricted to uh, that kind of uh, uh, number. But if you again uh, uh, take into uh, account that you know temperature and other factors are there, then uh, we can we can actually eventually go higher than all number. But in this case, uh, we could not go beyond, uh, beyond 40 Weisenberg number. Okay, one more question from the last, uh, I mean this one. No, no, I mean the prince, uh, okay. previous slide. So in the uh, Weisenberg number greater than 15, if yeah. you just look at the last two plot, I mean points, so there are almost, I mean, uh, the slope is constant, right? right. I mean, yeah, yeah. So what's, what's the reason? Uh, yeah, so we are, thinking, uh, we are thinking that the system, you know, there is a uh, gradual development of that, uh, of the instability that is happening. But, uh, but also if you look at this picture, this has been taken, you know, this is uh, this has been taken at a larger. You know, the dead points have been taken at a larger, uh, like uh, uh, more time has been given to take single points. So uh, this is just uh, to have a idea of the flow curve. But uh, of course, there will be small change, but which will not be in significant. Thank you. Okay. If there are no more questions, let's thank Abhishek once again. Thank you. Okay. Enjoy. Uh, the last speaker of uh, this session is Ashin Devraj from Astrophysics. Uh, let's welcome Ashin. Hi. So, uh, I'm going to be talking about a specific neutron star X-ray binary. And uh, this work was done in collaboration with Shweta, Rahul and Vishwajit. And uh, we used data from three different telescopes here to uh, study this. And uh, that's AstroSat, NewStar, and Inside X XMP. So I'll just. So uh, typically, in a system like this, which is a B X ray binary, you have a neutron star and a main sequence star. So this is like a sun like star. And that is a B type star, and it's rapidly rotating. So when it's rotating, it ejects material around uh, it in a circumstellar disk. So whenever the neutron star dips through a circumstellar disk, matter falls onto it, and then it gets accreted. So then it becomes bright in X-rays. So what you, and in the case that the neutron star's rotation axis and the magnetic axis are misaligned, then what you end up having, have, I mean, seeing is pulsations because of that. Because uh, when matter falls onto the neutron star, it, it there is relative angular momentum between the neutron star and the infalling material, so it will form a disk. Now this disk will terminate at a certain distance, which is called the Alfvén radius. And this alpha radius is where the magnetic field pressure starts dominating the infalling, the, the pressure, I mean, becomes equal to the infalling uh, ram pressure and then it starts guiding the matter onto the poles of neutrons along the field lines. So then the emission happens parallel to the field lines. Now if you have misalignment between the rotation axis and the magnetic axis, then you start seeing pulsations, like a lighthouse, what you see. What you see here is an average average X-ray emission profile. Within 0 to 2 pi, what will the emission profile look like? That, that's what this is. It's a double peak structure. So you can sort of imagine if you have a, uh, uh, this is a, a rotation axis and this is a magnetic axis, 
and if the neutral star is pointing out, this, I mean the poles are pointing this way, when it goes around you will see one single sharp emission profile. But if it is at 90 degree you might see it twice. So, you will see double peaked or single peaked. I mean, so of course, it is not easy to interpret if it is single peaked or double peaked based on uh, or you cannot say what the angle is based on if it is single peaked or double peaked, I will get to it later. But point is, it is the average emission profile. So, what happens after the matter falls onto the uh, poles? So, there you have all kinds of uh, radiative processes happening like thermal Bremsstrahl lung, black body emission from the accretion mound that builds up onto the poles. And then all of these soft photons get upscattered by the infalling material to higher energy, inverse Compton scattering. So, then you will have harder x-rays coming. Soft x-rays means lower energy x-rays, hard x-rays means higher energy x-rays. So, all these soft photons get upscattered to produce hard x-rays and <clears throat> that forms the bulk of the spectrum that we see. Okay. So, the main focus of this entire work in the talk is cyclotron lines. So, these are basically Landau levels. And what happens is that when you apply very strong magnetic fields, I mean you can have Landau levels at all um, uh, energies, but when you apply very strong magnetic fields, then the Lama radius keeps becoming smaller. Okay. Now, when the Lama radius becomes comparable to the de Broglie wavelength of the electron or it becomes smaller than de Broglie wavelength of the electron, quantum effects start taking over. So, now it does not just go around in a helical manner, the orbits get quantized. So, you can, if you have an electron in a lower energy level, in order to kick it to a higher energy level, you need to specify very, su su supply very specific amount of uh, energy, which is h or omega here. And so omega is the Lama frequency and it is no longer a continuous transition. That is what <coughs> this means. And in very high magnetic field cases, you have formation of Landau levels. Now, this expression is something that we can use to clearly understand what is happening. You can see that E and B are linear related and this is a simplified version of the same thing. In pull, to put it in context, what it means is that if I observe a cyclotron line at a specific energy which is let us say 11.6 keV, then that means that the magnetic field strength at that place is 10 power 12 Gauss. That is what this formula tells us. So, 11.6 keV cyclotron line means 10 power 12 Gauss of magnetic field. This is the best diagnostic tool that we have to tell what the magnetic field near a neutron star is, the most direct way of estimation. So, right. So, now getting to the source, this is a, like I mentioned, it is a binary system, neutron star and a main sequence star and the orbital period is about 172 days and then the spin period of the neutron star is about 15.7 seconds. Now, this is at a distance of 8.7 kiloparsec from us, the large uncertainty in the distance measurement and previously when it was discovered in 1998 a cyclotron line was reported in its spectrum. I will show you what a cyclotron line looks like in a spectrum. But it was reported in a spectrum and using the same formula which I showed you in the previous slide, it implies a magnetic field strength of approximately 3.1 and 10 power 12 Gauss. Okay. After that 1998 outburst, the source was, uh, I mean, went into outburst in 2010, 2018 and 2021. So, notice that these are transients. We cannot just switch on our instrument and then say that let us see what is happening. Our instrument should be sensitive enough to pick it and that happens only when these objects go into outburst and that happened in 98, 2010, 2018 and 2021. So, the majority of this work involves the 2018 outburst and the 2021 outburst. Okay. So, the data we used are from three instruments like I mentioned, AstroSat for the 2018 outburst, HXMT which is a Chinese telescope for the 2018 outburst and NewStar for 2018. And 2021 only AstroSat had observed it and we have data of that also. Uh, so, okay. So, this is what is uh, a swift bat light curve. So, you have time on the x axis and the count rate on the y axis. So, swift bat is a burst alert telescope which monitors, you know, uh, these objects and then it sees that over days, these are uh, in the, the scales on days, it goes bright and goes down approximately 120 days or something is the duration of the outburst. So, the first one that you see here, AstroSat saw this object when it was in the rising phase of the outburst. The pink one that you see is at the peak of the outburst by inside HXMT and the green one that you see is the new star observation during the reclining phase of the outburst. Notice something that the peak of the outburst, the flux is somewhere, the count rate is approximately 0 0.3, 0 0.3233 3, 3 something. Okay. So, the, that is at the peak and this happens. The next outburst, 2021 outburst, the maximum flux it reaches 
is approximately 0 0.02, where it was 0 0.03, 32 or something there. While this uh, time where the astrocyte had seen it was during the declining phase at 0 0.01. So, which means it was twice as bright in the previous outburst and astrocyte has seen it when it was at lower flux. So, what do we find? Here is the thing. What we find for different observations, this is in chronological order that you can see, is that you can see the period. The period when we saw it with astrocyte, when it was in the rising phase outburst is 15.755, then it goes 754, then 751. What does it tell us? It tells us the period is decreasing, which means the source was spinning up, which means the pulsar hum somehow was, I mean the matter falling onto the pulsar was actually applying a torque on it and it was making the neutron star spin up. That is why the period is decreasing. And the, the astrocyte observation of 2021 is so long that we could actually constrain the p dot, which is negative, you can see that. This is because the period is decreasing or the frequency is increasing of the pulsar. Okay. So, now what we did is that I showed a pulse profile, the average emission profile of the pulsar in the second slide. And here we have done the same thing for different energy ranges, 3 to 12 keV, 12 to 22, 22, uh, 12 to 22, 22 to 32 and so on. You can see that the over the energy ranges, the shape of the uh, double peak structure, the pulse profile shape is changing. So, here to here is actually 0 to 2 pi and then it is repeated again, that is all it is. So, you can see the shape changes to a single peak as we go to higher energy at about 37 keV, the second peak disappears. This is the HXMT observation, sorry, HXMT results of the same outburst. You can see that even though it changes along the energy lines, I mean uh, different energy levels, you can see that in the same energy range, they are almost the same, the pulse profiles. And this is a comparison of the new star and astrocyte. New star was the third thing during the declination, I mean declining phase of the 2018 outburst. Again, you can see that a double peak structure changes to a single peak structure at higher energies. Change prominently happens at 32 to 30, 32 to 42 keV. While the <coughs> asteroid observation, when you compare it with that, the profile's evolution is similar across over the energy ranges, even though it is almost same through time. So, this is a comparison of the 2018 and the 2021 outbursts. These are two different outbursts. The first case you saw how it goes through one outburst, here is like two different outbursts entirely, how it, how it is. Even here, it goes from double peak to single peak and around this range it disappears. So, something happening at 32 to 42 kV. Okay. Now, coming to the spectral modeling. This is like what we are looking at, the cyclotron lines that we are talking about are basically absor absorption features. So, while studying any absorption like features, you first need to model the continuum. And this is what the continuum model looks like uh, up till this point, up to the 10 kV feature. This is what the continuum model looks like. We have different continuum phenomenological models so that we can uh, cleanly model the continuum. And then we will try to account for what the cyclotron line features are, which is fit by a Gaussian like feature. So, you can see here that this at 37 kV. This is our cyclotron line. This dip is something called the 10 kV feature, which we see in several different X-ray pulsar sources, which is independent of instrument, independent of time, independent of flux. So, the consensus in the community is that since it always comes at 10 kV, it has to be a modeling artifact. We need more sophisticated models to account for it. But this feature here is dependent on flux, depends on time, depends on pulse phase. So, we know there's a cyclotron line feature. So, when we include a Gaussian here, centered at 37 kV, the residuals become smooth. In the third panel, we have just set the strength after the best fit to 0. So, you can see how prominent this is, the cyclotron line feature is, as well as when you compare the lower energy part of the residuals to the low, I mean low energy part of the best fit residuals, you will realize that they are identical. We have done statistical tests to prove that they are identical. So, which means that the cyclotron line that is present at 38 kV is not an artifact of modeling of the entire continuum. That is the first thing we need to establish. So, there is a cyclotron line, it is not an artifact of the modeling. And uh, these are the same plots for astrocyte observation, where you can see the line prominently, the 10 kV feature as well as the line prominently here. And we have done the same thing where we set the sense to 0 here. And the cyclotron line energy of astrocyte, which is in the rising phase of the outburst, goes up to 42 kV. This is one point to be noted. And then for HXMT observation, I hope you can see the green points here, we have done the same thing. And then the line comes at 48 kV, much, much higher energy. So, for the 2021 outburst, the energy, the cyclotron line goes back to 38 kV. Okay. Now, we have done one more thing here to see how the cyclotron line energy depends on the pulse phase of the neutron star. As the neutron star is spinning, what happens to the, uh, so let us say that you have the magnetic field lines of neurons are going that way. So, it is spinning this way. 
right? So you're looking at it at different phases when it is spinning that way. So now at each phase you can divide, you can selectively take the photons from each of these things by if it's a 15 sec 10 second period, I can just literally say every one second after the period, I'll just take the photons and build a spectrum. That's what phase dissolved spectroscopy does. So if this is zero to two pi, from here to here is zero to two pi, I just divide it into 10 parts and then I extract spectrum for each one. What we find is that in the first peak, all the photons correspond to the first peak, we do not find the cyclotron line. All the photons correspond to the second peak, in individual places, you find cyclotron line. Notice this is actually where the second peak disappeared in 32 to 42 keV range when I had showed you all those energy resolved pulse profiles, in this energy range, the second peak disappeared. So that it has something to do with the cyclotron line. Maybe cyclotron absorption is actually causing the second peak to disappear, okay? So then what we wanted to probe is to see if it's actually stronger in the second peak. The cyclotron line is seen much more strongly in the second peak than the first one. So we took the ratio of the data from this peak to this peak and we find that the dip is so prominent. This is just a ratio plot of the two things. <clears throat> this plot you see here is for all the instruments and you can see irrespective of which instrument we look at, which observation we look at, the ratio which means uh, ratio which is telling us the, the cyclotron line is more prominently present in the second peak than the first can be seen in all these plots. This is a 2018 HXMT observation astrocyte and then 2021 astrocyte. So, What's the point of all this? You're seeing a cyclotron line, what's the big deal? See, like I said, this is the best estimator that we have of the magnetic field near a neutron star. So which means the question is, what does it depend on? It depends on flux, it depends on time. So we, so this is a plot of flux versus cyclotron line energy. Does it change with the flux? Populating this plot is the research goal of this work. It's not very easy to say what the correlation here is. You need to have a lot more points. But one advantage is that, see, it's seen over a large range of fluxes. Not many neutron star sources are seen over such a large range of fluxes. So these are many different neutron star sources. These are the sources which show proper correlations or anti-correlations of flux and luminosity that you can see here. And we need to know what these correlations are before we can actually say, you know, what the magnetic field strength is. Because if it varies, then you need to know that this is how it depends on it. So... I guess I'll just stop here because I'm running short of time. I can definitely take questions. So just to summarize, the neutron, this specific neutron star went into outburst in 2018 and 2021. It was observed with neutron star astrocyte in its assembly, and then uh, for a cyclotron line that you saw, the absorption like feature at 37 keV, <coughs> it implies a magnetic field strength of 3.2 in 10 power 12 Gauss. So now the rising peak of the phase of the outburst, we find that the cyclotron line energy is higher at 48 keV and 43 keV from astrocyte and inside HXMT. And the fact that the cyclotron line is not present in all the pulse phases, this is unique. Like out of hundreds of X-ray binaries that we know, only 40 or so exhibit cyclotron line sources. I mean cyclotron lines in them. Not all of them exhibit cyclotron lines. There's only a handful of them out of a, a fraction. So even among them, this is the only source in which the cyclotron line is not seen in all the phases. It's only seen in a narrow range of, you know, 50% of the phases. So, and uh, this is observed over a huge uh, range of luminosities. And which is important because, like I would just want to mention here, that these are sources which have shown a positive correlation with cyclotron line energy and luminosity, GX304 plus 1. And then this has shown a negative correlation. But the fact is that this is in a log plot. In order for you to be able to see this kind of correlation, the source should be available in a large range of luminosities. I mean, source should transition through a large range of luminosities. And this is one of the sources which does that. This is a slightly unique source that way. Uh, I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, nice uh, work, uh, Ashwin. I have one question on the 10 kV line, which you described it as a modeling problem. Did you mean to say it is a processing artifact? It's a theoretical. So this is independent. This feature that you see is independent of instrument. I, RXT has seen the source. I mean, like I mentioned here, um, RXT, Beposax, Suzaku, these are all instruments of different times. And this is not the only source which in which that comes up. There are at least seven other X-ray pulsars in which it comes up. I mean, this 10 kV feature, number one. Number two, it's independent of flux. No matter what phase of the flux you see, it doesn't change. So it, first of all, it's independent of instrument. It's independent of flux. And it's independent of pulse phase. So pulse phase is a question telling us about if a parameter is changing with pulse phase, with the spin of the neutron star. 
it means that it is happening on the neutron star or right next to the neutron star and dragged along with it. If it is not changed with the pulse phase of the neutron star, then it means it's happening farther away. It's a constant. It's like a constant offset, that parameter. Okay. So it does not change with the pulse phase. It does not change with the flux. It does not change the instrument. It's coming exactly at 10 keV in several different sources. Whether those have cyclotron lines or not, it is still turning up with that. So one question that you could ask me that I didn't go into detail here was about this n, that number that we see here. This, this is a harmonic. Okay, so which means if it jumps to the, uh, the electron jumps from the first ground state to the second excited state, that's a se second harmonic, second harmonic, fundamental second harmonic and so on. So you can have multiple dips in the thing. So there is a source, for example, I can tell you, which has a cyclotron line at 12 keV, 24 keV, 36 and so on. So you can see multiple dips that keep coming that way. Okay, now these are harmonics, but now we are seeing a line at 10 keV over here. And then we are seeing at 37 keV. So this, these can't be harmonics. Firstly, these are not harmonics. And I can tell you that even in the pulse resolve, phase resolved spectroscopy that we are doing here, in the second peak, the cyclotron line totally disappears. 10 keV features is there everywhere. <laughs> it doesn't go away. So what the consensus in the community is, the theoreticians are saying, is that power law is an approximation that, that we are talking about. One of the things that we model it with phenomenologically, the power law and a cutoff. That is an approximation. When you go to more sophisticated models, there will be wiggles that come here and there when the quality of data improves and all that. So this 10 kV feature is also possibly an artifact of our simplistic modeling. So if we go to more sophisticated models, accounting for the neutron star <coughs> environment and other things, we will probably account for the 10 kV feature. This is uh, yeah, it's more, <coughs> more of a serious concern, I think, right? Modeling problem. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Ashwin, uh, talking yeah. about harmonics. Yes. So you see that uh, without having seen the harmonics, how do you know that this is a cyclotron line? Ah, okay, so the, the entire work is to make sure that it exists, first of all. that First thing is that, like I mentioned, that it is not an artifact of our modeling. It can be an artifact of modeling if I put two power laws in some haphazard way, that will also cause a dip somewhere, break and something. So the entire work here, uh, the, the three residuals that you see here, firstly, is that first point or first assumption I'm going to say the, why it's the cyclotron, first reasoning, is that if I were to model only up to 27 keV, so below that, there's no, so there's a continuum emission that's happening. And then there is a certain region which absorbs all these photons. So if I don't care about that region which absorbs the photons, it's just a continuum emission that's coming. I should, coming, I should be modeling that. And if the cyclotron line exists or not, that those continuum parameters should remain exactly the same. So what we did here was we fit the, the entire spectrum in the second panel that you see here. And then in the third panel, we just set the strength of the cyclotron line energy to zero which means that that component is not there entirely. So the residues up to this point for the best fit model versus up to 27 keV, where the cyclotron line should have no influence, they match. Statistically, uh, they match. That's number one. And number two, we, dif we tried different continuum models. One continuum model might have a break in its modeling pattern, where there's an exponential cutoff or something that could have some feature art that could give result in an artifact. So we tried different phenomenological continuum models and all of the, in all their in all those cases, we see this dip at 37 keV. So this is one thing. So what you're asking about is not seeing harmonics, for which we need a higher energy thing. If this is a fundamental 37 keV, the next harmonic will come at 70, 80 keV, at very broad. So we need first of all the uh, one thing I want to show you in this panel is the energy resolved pulse profile, right? Look at 52 to 79 keV. Our, my new star works and. Actually, almost all the instruments here work in this energy range of 3 to 80 keV. In the uh, 52 to 79 keV, you can see pulsations are not clear. Photons are not there for us to say that this is coming from the neutron star. Like, this is the limit of our instrumentation at the moment. And also, even if it's pretty sensitive, that has to be so much brighter in harder X-rays for us to pick it up in this energy band. HXMT, for example, goes up to 200 keV. But photons are not good enough, I mean, are not enough in that there's not enough pulsation to see in, to say that look we can actually model harmonics. So I mean I would say that look at HXMT data but then there's no, not enough photons, not that bright. So you need to pick a source which is so bright and showing harmonics <laughs> for us to actually pick it up which is a very rare uh, incident. If there are no more questions, let's thank Ashwin once again. So once again, I'm thanking all the speakers of this session and also for questions from the audience.
Um, good afternoon. So we'll start with the second last session of this uh, in-house meeting. Um, so uh, the first talk in this session is by H.V. Raghavindra. He's from Astronomy and Astrophysics. And he'll be talking to us about uh, primordial non-Gaussianity from ultra low role inflation. Okay, over to you. Uh, thanks, organizers, for giving me this opportunity. I will be talking about uh, uh, this particular primordial non-Gaussianity from ultra low role inflation, which is based on a set of works that I recently completed. Uh, this is the outline of my talk, where I will first uh, discuss the general uh, quantities related to primordial perturbations and how they connect to various observables of our current universe. I will focus specifically on ultra slow role inflation and my main thrust of this talk is to convince that the standard Gaussian treatments of uh, primordial perturbations has to be rethought about and we have to account for higher order corrections coming from non-Gaussianities. Finally, I will summarize with a brief outlook. So just to brush up, the inflationary epoch which is uh, invoked during the early stages of matter uh, uh, radiation dominated uh, epoch of the universe is necessary to solve the shortcomings of hot Big Bang model. For instance, to explain the current level of homogeneity and isotropy in the current universe, we need this inflationary epoch at the very beginning. It also generates the primordial perturbations, which are reflected as tiny anisotropies that we observe in the current CMB sky and the, which further grow to form the galaxies and large scale structure of the current universe. These primordial perturbations are generated as the quantum fluctuations of the field that drives inflationary epoch and that field is typically modeled as driven by a canonical uh, single field scalar potential as shown here uh, in a rough cartoon. So the nice one to one correspondence between different scales of observation of our current universe and this picture of a single field driving inflation is that different scales of observation correspond to different regimes of evolution of the universe, uh, field during that epoch in that the large scales as I have indicated in the left panel correspond to early times and hence early evolution of the field whereas the small scales of corresponding to gravity waves and so on connect to the late time evolution of the field close to the bottom of the potential. So by focusing on different cosmological observational probes and characterizing the perturbations therein, we, we are in principle deciphering the shape of the potential that governed the inflationary epoch. This is the conventional picture and this is a very telling pro, very telling picture in that it uh, gives the various probes that are constraining the perturbations, particularly the power spectrum of the scalar perturbations across a range of wave numbers and this in turn tells us something about the uh, primordial dynamics. For instance, the large scales are well constrained by CMB pro probes that you may have known about the Planck mission and so on and there are upcoming probes such as gravitational wave probes over the small scales. But this is all nice and well, up to in the Gaussian treatment where the modes uh, evolve largely independent of each other and there is no mode coupling and there are no nonlinear effects or non-Gaussianity. To quantify Gaussian as well as non-Gaussian nature of the perturbations, let us define these conventional quantities called the power spectrum and the bispectrum denoted as P, S and G, which are nothing but two point correlations of the primordial scalar perturbations in Fourier space and the three point correlations respectively. The Conventional quantity, a dimensionless convenient quantity to characterize this uh, non Gaussianity present in the bispectrum is called the FNL, and that is just a suitable dimensionless ratio of the bispectrum to the combination of power spectra. One can, in principle, estimate all of these quantities if we know the theory of the inflation, particularly the field driving inflation and the perturbations therein during the early epoch. I will now focus specifically on ultra slow role models just to illustrate that how our naive expectation of Gaussian treatment easily breaks down and we have to account for non-Gaussianity. There are a plethora of models in the literature. I have just briefly given the forms of the potential you can refer to the work to as to the motivation of individual potentials which can drive inflation using a given shape of potential that is roughly like this. The characteristic feature of these ultra slow role models is that there is typically an inflection point present somewhere in the uh, evolution of the field. What this gives rise to? At the level of power spectrum, the amplitude of power spectrum in, is enhanced to extremely large scales. This is sought after in the recent literature because enhancing power spectrum naively means that you are increasing the variance of the density perturbation field in real space. And when the variance of the distribution is large, it means that exotic objects are not anymore exotic. You can easily produce those high dense exotic objects. These perturbations typically produce what are called primordial black holes and secondary gravitational waves associated with them. I am not going into the details of this particular phenomenon, 
but I'm just providing a context of why ultrafloral models are sought after because they have this particular impact in the current observational universe. You can refer to these references to the for exploring further in this context. But what I would like to emphasize is that this is still assuming a Gaussian treatment of perturbations. You are having a density field, you are enha enhancing the variance and you are producing more and more exotic high dense objects. But is it sufficient? If we consider the power spectrum, Gaussian treatment is sufficient to capture. But if we move on to higher order correlations, particularly the bispectrum, you see that the bispectrum arising from these two representative models that I am plotting of ultra slow roll also get enhanced over the same scales and over the same amplitude, up to the same amplitude as the power spectrum as I have illustrated in different limits in the uh, corresponding plots. This means that there is high, something highly non-Gaussian about the perturbations which we are just ignoring if we are looking just at the power spectrum. So we have to account for this large amplitude by spectra. How to account for it? As we know, the FNL parameter that I defined earlier captures the non-Gaussianity and if we compute that for the two cases that I am referring to in various limits, then I see these highly non-trivial shapes and features present in the FNL along with large amplitudes. Clearly, this field is a non-Gaussian field and if the primordial field itself is non-Gaussian, the subsequent evolution that follows and the subsequent connection to observables is going to be highly non-trivial and we have to carefully account for them in our analysis. I will illustrate two examples of how to account for these non-Gaussianities in connecting to observables. One is the CMB. How to connect the primordial FNL to CMB? We can expand the scalar perturbation that I defined earlier to account for this FNL, the non-Gaussianity parameter through this expansion. The first is the Gaussian part, the second integral is essentially a, a corresponding to something like a loop momentum integral which accounts for the three point vertex namely the non-Gaussianity parameter FNL. The complete power spectrum of this uh, perturbation shall be now the Gaussian power spectrum plus what I call as TC, the non-Gaussian power spectrum or the correction due to the non-Gaussian parameter to the original Gaussian power spectrum. I can simply represent them as these two following Feynman diagrams. If I do that and compute what is the corresponding observable in my CMB, this is what I have for the primordial power spectrum. The red shaded curves, red to yellow correspond to the conventional Gaussian power spectrum arising from a particular model of ultra slow roll inflation and these green shaded curves, I have varied a particular parameter associated with ultra slow roll models. I will discuss this particular parameter offline if, it is in, if anyone is interested. But what I am trying to illustrate is the PC, the non-Gaussian contribution has extremely dynamic feature though subdominant compared to the PS and that can in principle connect when connected to the current observables of CMB, the angular power spectra are plotted in the same color coding can leave up to 1 to 10 percent effect in the standard angular power spectrum. So this is in fact a way of indirectly constraining the primordial non-Gaussianities just by using the angular power spectrum data of CMB. Second example, I can do the same loop, uh, 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 loop calculation treatment to connect to secondary gravitational waves arising from same models of ultra slow roll inflation. This is just to provide a context, if I track the scalar perturbations, I will arrive at the CMB spectrum. If I track the tensor perturbations and account for the non-Gaussianity in that, I will arrive at what is called the omega GW, the strength of gravitational waves arising from the same models of inflation. I am just show, not showing the equations, I am just showing the corresponding Feynman diagrams. These are complicated but uh, quite understandable Feynman diagrams that one can compute if uh, one is computationally uh, adept and intensive. What I am showing here is for the two models of interest, the Gaussian spectra or the uh, omega GW arising from Gaussian perturbations are uh, presented in the red and blue solid lines and the dashed lines correspond to the three non-Gaussian contributions that are shown here and unlike CMB, the non-Gaussian contributions are even stronger and are reaching magnitudes comparable or even slightly dominant than the Gaussian contribution in case of omega GW. So these are the two illustrations I wanted to mainly emphasize about in that in models of inflation, particularly when there are features that are present during the evolution of the potential, the evolution of the field in the potential like ultra slow roll models, whenever we compute observables of current day using primordial perturbations, we have to check if there are non-Gaussian uh, contributions to those observables and we have to consistently account for them. One particular method that I have presented is through the Feynman diagrams that we already know from the literature of quantum field theory. With that, I will summarize the crucial results of my talk that ultra slow roll models are promising candidates being considered in recent inflationary literature and they are uh, known to produce significant amount of primordial black hole, secondary gravitational waves and so on. But beside that context and beyond, 
these non gaussianities the, the models produce significant non gaussianities as well at least at the level of three point functions and when we account for them in our computation of observables they leave significant imprint in the current observable universe so when we are performing data analysis going forward in future if we are comparing models against data we have to account for gaussian as well as non gaussian prediction arising from the same model <coughs> so that we can consistently arrive at a comprehensive and effective constraint on the model parameters of the primordial physics so with that i will conclude my talk thanks for your attention and i'll take questions thank you for a very nice talk uh, we are open for questions so i think in the beginning you you showed this a list of these potentials right yes uh, so these are phenomenological potential or there is a basis from which you uh, i mean how do you get this potential is just uh, you try it out this potential no we yeah. we haven't constructed these potentials we have listed this from the literature each model yeah yeah i understand i understand uh, yeah, like in the literature these are, potentials are yes there are high energy physics motivations for individual models some of them are arising from some of the supersymmetry models that are uh, quite popular in high energy physics literature mm -hmm. some are arising from higher order uh, gravity uh, ff or gravity Uh, models which have been converted from Einstein frame to Jordan frame. You can refer to individual details of each of the potentials in this. This is a review that we recently constructed. So X okay. is phi, right? They are, I guess, on the right hand side. Sorry, yeah. All the X's are phi, I guess, right, on the right hand side. Yeah, the field is phi. Yes. On the right hand side, this. On the X, right hand no, side. No, no, no. In the V of phi is the six phi square, I guess, right? Six, yes, x's are related to phi, so they are written in a dimensionless fashion. I should have mentioned it here. Okay, so so x is something like phi by phi naught and so on, using suitable uh, okay. rescaling of the same okay. parameter. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so, from what I, what you've said so far, it sounds like uh, uh, because one would have to look at the three point correlations and so on, and right. presumably also higher order yes. correlation. Um, small uh, non Gaussianity. Right. Can really grow, from what I can tell, is what you're uh, what you're suggesting. The question right. I have about non-Gaussianity is that, at some level, the Gaussian construction is a very idealistic one, right? Right. And we don't expect physically that there will be no deviations at all from Gaussianity. True. Uh, can you? And you said also that you can constrain, at least at the level that you've calculated. What are your constraints on the fluctuations? Of the non-Gaussian, uh, of the non, I mean, of the non-Gaussianities right. that you have, right. and are they are those scales that you have commensurate with, say, uh, the scale of physics at that time, for example, right? Okay. I mean, uh, you are uh, talking yeah. about energy scales. Yeah, involved. I mean, okay. you can choose whichever uh, okay. uh, dimensionful parameter you want to use, but okay. So, uh, as to the first question, the non-Gaussianities can, in principle, lead to. Uh, something like one to ten percent correction in the, uh, uh, with respect to the standard Gaussian power spectrum that is typically considered. I am just illustrating a well-motivated model, but there are templates, other templates in the literature which I have studied in. Uh, we have studied all those templates as well in this paper, where in principle one can lead to significant higher uh, order corrections to the Gaussian spectrum as well, and we can in principle arrive. In this work, we have not compared exactly against data, but that is something that we are currently working on. So we can, in principle, at least put an upper bound. That is what we are aiming for: an upper bound on the FNL parameter to begin with, and if possible, on the para model parameters, the potential parameters which determine the FNL in future when comparing against the CMB data set. Yeah. So what do you think about the allowed range of non-Gaussianities should be within a? I mean, should be. You you can't push it to too small a uh, level of non-Gaussianity is what I'm trying to oh, say. Yeah, I'm, I'm suggesting that if okay. you did that, okay. then the scale. I mean, you have to then argue why I mean, you'll have a secondary <laughs> why you know the the problem of uh, you know the, the whole cosmological problem would be reduced to now another question in inflation. Why God? Not God. just why this particular potential, but also why. Are non-Gaussianity is so small because right. that will be a new scale in the right. in in your Definitely. theory, which you will have to also explain. Right. So that's what so, I'm curious about, and right. we, uh, we can discuss this. But just to briefly mention, as to the lower bound, what is the minimum possible non-Gaussianity that can arise? That actually has been obtained not from these exotic models, even from conventional slow roll inflationary models. That it can be of order epsilon one, where epsilon one is of order 10 power minus two to 10 power minus three. So that is that lower bound is already somewhat there. 
Uh, just one quick question on the same slide, 11. Uh, when you talk about it's, uh, yeah, yeah uh, on the power spectrum. So, I mean, uh, Planck, for example, has done a very high precision measurement uh, and there have been upper bounds on FNL from there, right? Right. So how does these kinds of predictions fare with the existing constraints? Right. A very important question that the, the constraints that are there from Planck, which I have not mentioned here, are for specific simple templates of FNL. Those templates of FNL are not ideal uh, templates that arise from these non-trivial models. They are typically motivated saying that they can be obtained from a smooth potential or rather a featureless potential. The constraints on themselves, even those simple templates are very large of order 1 or order 10. We only have bounds, we don't have strict constraints. What I am presenting here is quite non-trivial in that, firstly, this model, the FNL arising from this model, for instance, FNL like this, doesn't fit any template. So, those templates from Planck paper say nothing about these FNLs, first point. Secondly, we have, we have yet to constrain this exactly against data and we are not quite sure how that uh, upper bound translates to, to the FNL itself because we will be running model against data. So, we will get direct constraints on the model parameters of this potential itself. So, that is exactly what we are relying on. The Planck constraint was done against the bispectrum map. So it was three point versus three point correlation. Now we are saying that I will fold in my three point into a two point correlation and I'm going to compare FNL three point function against a two point function. So uh, I expect a better bound uh, in our future work that we are completing. Thanks. Uh, if no other questions, let's thank the speaker once again. And uh, please accept your token from the organizers. Our next speaker is Professor Sumati Surya. She'll be uh, talking about when is one space time close to another. Uh, so today I thought I'll talk about something somewhat different from what I normally talk about, which is a causal set theory and quantum gravity, but talk about a more broad question that arises. Uh, and that is, when can you say two space times? So think of it as a whole space time here and a whole space time there. And you're saying, when are these two spaces close to each other? And how will I measure whether they're similar to each other or not? Okay, so how do I, okay, I do this, right? Okay, yeah. So here's a motivation. Um, uh, you can ask within general relativity itself, we have the sense of some small perturbation. We just talked, uh, we heard Raghavendra's talk, where he's talked about these little fluctuations that can lead to large changes in the future. And these are things one might be concerned about. Um, for example, even if there's a parameter that you can tune and you can say, well, that parameter is small, sometimes you can land up in trouble because here's an example of a charged black hole where you have an electric charge and a black hole, so you have mass as well as charge. That charge can all, has to be smaller than the mass. When it's equal to the mass, this particular geometry is distinct, very different from the one when you're off this extremal uh, position. So, in some sense, that is infinitely far away, that particular geometry, even though the mass could be, or the charge could be very, very close to extremality. So here's an example of two things that are really very far. And uh, similarly, you can have small perturbations that lead to large changes. There are also instances, just like in any dynamical system, of chaotic. So chaotic uh, properties of general relativity. So you start off with initial data, which are very close to each other. And uh, however, you can land up with very, very different space types. Um, so questions of geometric stability of space times comes in this uh, purview. Uh, the kind of reason I became interested in this question and many of us are interested is because when you're talking about quantum gravity, we're talking about geometries which have a certain quantum property to them. And they could in the small be very, very different from classical space time, right? So they could have very fractal structure, there could be all kinds of structure on very small scales. But at the right limit, in the right limits, you want to be able to recover continuum space times, classical space time. So you want to be able to say, when is that quantum geometry like the classical geometry? Okay, how will we, how can we compare these spaces? So here are examples of triangulated space times. Uh, this is my favorite, of course, causal sets, and this happens to not be anything like a space-time, but I won't talk about it today. And here are these uh, sort of a depiction of uh, these uh, ideas of there being extra dimensions, so four-dimensional space-time, but uh, maybe ten dimensions in superstring theory or in Kaluza-Klein theory, which far predated those ideas. 
that those extra dimensions are all curled up. They're all very, very small. Okay. So imagine the plane of this uh, slide of the uh, screen. And when you see it from far away, it looks two dimensional. But if I come up really close, I see that there's a certain thickness to it. But far up, you can't see it, right? So I have an extra dimension here, but you can't see it. But I'd like to be able to say that your four dimensional perception and the five dimensional reality here, or in this case, uh, two and three dimensional, are close in some sense. Okay, these are the kinds of questions that motivate us. Okay. Um, Oops. So how do we measure closeness? And of course, distance is the way we measure closeness. And we know very well how to do this in flat space time from coordinate geometry, how to measure distances. We also have a sense of how to measure distances on curved space times, curved, sorry, spaces. And I'm just going to look at Riemannian for now, no space time. And I just go along the geodesic, the closest geodesic. And I take the length along that, and that gives me the distance measure. Now, more broadly, what do we expect of a distance? We expect that the distance of a point to itself is zero, right? We also expect that distances between points that are actually distinct is a positive quantity, right? We expect that distance to be positive. We also expect that the distance between P and Q and Q and P are the same. It's symmetric with respect to P and Q. And also that it satisfies the triangle inequality, which is that between P and Q, that distance is always less than or equal to that between a third point, R. So P to R and R to Q, if you add those two, that will always be larger than the distance you have, larger or equal to the distance you have, depending on whether you have a collinear situation or not. Right? So now from that very simple picture of uh, distance, you can now ask, well, okay, you have distance between points, but now what about distance between spaces, subspaces? Okay, so here are examples. So I have A here and I have a plethora of different types of Bs here. Okay, and we look at some of them. And you can say, well, let me first look at just a point and look at a space. So some ball of uh, uh, some region, okay some sphere in the space. And I want to say, well, how far is this point from that? Now, there are multiple ways of doing this, of course. But you want to capture a way of doing it that is most effective, depending on the uh, question you want to answer. And basically, the idea is that you have the distance between point P and B is the shortest distance between P and B. Okay. So if I have B to be this, and I take P like that, then it's this distance here. It's the shortest distance to the second uh, space, B. And so I will say shortest is in, in maths lingo is infimum. So I'm going to be writing these terms here. The smallest distance you can get between that point and any other point there, I'm going to call that my distance. There's a new distance I can now uh, construct out of this called the Hausdorff distance, which has a very curious pro property. And we'll talk about it a little bit more. But it's defined in the following way that here we had the shortest and now we talk about longest because we want to be able to take a point here and we looked at we varied points in this space and we got the shortest distance to p now we want to vary p and get all the sets of shortest distances collect them up together and then find the largest of them so we keep making this shortest lo uh, largest sorry yeah Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Here, uh, right now, I'm not going to talk about any other space. These are just subspaces. And I, sh I think in my next slide, I've written explicitly Rn. It's just the plane. For the purposes of this talk, much of what I'll say, you can just reduce down to the plane. It will illustrate everything you need to know. So it's just on the plane. These are just subspaces, OK? so. What I'm going to do then is I, I take the largest of the uh, of these shortest distances, that's supremum. And of course, the distance between, when I do that, the distance between A and B, and B and A may not be the same. So in order to symmetrize, I take the maximum of those two values. So this gives me what I call a, a Hausdorff distance between two subspaces. Okay. 
And if you look at that, uh, look at this example, if I have these two subspaces A and B, uh, then it's very clear that if I did this kind of process, I would get exactly what I expect, which is the distance between the centers. And that would be the standard answer that you would get, that you would expect. And I could have said, why do I need all these complicated things? But I do need them if I start to now get a little, you know, if I think of this as a ball with a string attached to it, I have a really long object there. And now I'm asking what is the distance? And if I look at it, the distance between these two is not symmetric, but also it's going to now be given because when I maximize, it's going to be given by this longest, shortest distance. And uh, this is from Wikipedia, which says that the Hausdorff distance is the longest distance you can be forced to travel by an adversary who chooses a point in one of the two sets from where you must then travel to the other set. And one way of thinking about it is, if that was your newspaper route and you had to go everywhere, then uh, A would have it worse than B. Like a typical person in B would not have to go that far, but the typical person in A will have to go all the way in there, okay? So there's a sort of asymmetry in these two, and that's what the Hausdorff distance captures. Okay, um, oh my God. Hardly have any time. Okay, so here are examples of how Hausdorff distance are used. Um, and one very interesting thing is people use it actually in uh, medical imaging. They use it in image analysis. It's a very useful way of saying when things are close. Okay, it's just a couple of examples. Now, if you were able to, in this space, you have a, no, a non fermionic space, you're able to put these balls together, you're able to sit them one on top of the, each other. Uh, which you can do, right, in maths, and you can just slide one subset onto another, then you can ask, well, when I slide them one on top of the other, if the two spaces, so you had two balls which are identical to each other, then if I, I can slide them exactly so that there's perfect shape matching, right? When I do that, I expect that abstractly these spaces are the same. So the distance between them should be zero. And this partial shape matching you can do by further then taking the infimum, that is the smallest of this, longest of the shortest distance, okay? So there is a lot of this alternating that's going on here. And here, for example, you can translate, you can rotate. You're basically doing all of the possible things you can do, but without changing the metric, without changing the size of this object, okay? This is very important. And uh, so the distance between two isometric spaces, you can write like this. And of course, when you do that here, you see that this is the distance between these two spaces fundamentally. Okay, so I have to really hurry up. Um, so you can go further. And because mathematicians are not happy with just things on flat space, one would like to be able to say, well, okay, you found a distance between subspaces in a given space and why you allowed yourself to uh, translate them and rotate them and etc. and compare those shapes. But now let me define a measure where I can embed it into any space whatsoever. Okay, And that's as abstract as you can get. So take all possible spaces, all possible embeddings, and then you minimize over all possible things and you get what's called the gromov hausdorff distance. And this is a very nice distance that people talk about, but it's extremely hard to calculate. Um, I found a very recent paper, 2022, where the distance between spheres of different sizes was measured using the gromov hausdorff distance. And you can say that, see that the one that is perhaps the most easy to understand is the one between the zero sphere, which is just two points, um, and any sphere which is uh, where n is greater than or equal to 1. And in that case, you can see that the distance, you, the, the furthest you can put these two is on antipodal points. And the distance, if you define it as the inverse, cosine inverse of the, of the inner product, then uh, you'll see that it's just pi over 2. Okay? That's the distance you would get. Okay, so here's a question, and hopefully I'll say a few words about these questions. Should we care when the regions of difference are small, right? If I have a balloon and I have a balloon with a string and I know the kids, any of your kids are going to object to the, saying that they're the same because they know what the power of a string is. But should I, can I as a physicist mathematician consider these to be pretty much the same? 
how will I say that they're the same? Should the string count as much as it does in the Gromov house dog? Because here, if you have an infinitely long string, they'll be infinitely far away, whereas the balloon looks the same, okay? So can we uh, measure that? The other question, which I have like very little time to talk about is, uh, now because I started off with space times, is that in space times, we don't have a good uh, definition of measure of distance because it has all kinds of funny properties. Many of these properties are not satisfied because of the fact that you have this very annoying minus sign here, very annoying and yet very beautiful minus sign. And it tells you that things are zero distance even when they're not the same point because if you have things on the light cone, right, on traveling at the speed of light, then those two points are at zero distance from each other and so on and so forth. And you get the reverse triangle inequality because time-like distances are maximized and not minimized, okay? So you can ask, well, are these two space-time regions close? And it's actually a very difficult question to answer that, even though you might say, oh, I know that they're not very close. Um, and so here's just in the last few minutes, uh, the idea of uniform random sampling, which you can do, and I think this is also used in image processing, uh, where you basically say, let's Poisson distribute these shapes. And now when you do that Poisson distribution, you note that the number of points depends on an average, depends on the volume of the region. So if the volume of this region is very, very small, you expect very few points to be there. So they're not represented as much as they would have been in the Gromov Hausdorff distance, right? In the Hausdorff distance, sorry. And therefore, the string in this sense is a set of measure zero, right? Because this is with respect to the spatial volume. So any lower dimensional object has, is a set of measure zero with respect to such a uniform random sampling. And so you think you could easily say that these two are the same up to scale. There's a very beautiful work due to Bombelli from 2000, where he does a similar thing with causal sets, which I'm not talking about apparently. So <laughs> where you can then look at distributions, you extract an entire uh, Poisson, um, I mean, you do this Poisson process on space times, and again, it's a uniform sampling of space times, and what you extract from that are probability distributions over the set of n element posets. And then you can take those two probability distributions and then measure the difference between those two probability distributions, and then you can compare two different space times, okay? Um, and for example, if you did the same thing here, you'd see that if this has very little volume, you can again use that to show that these two spaces are approximately, okay. So I'll just end by saying we have uh, not just enjoyed ourselves doing, and so I didn't mention, although it was on my first slide, uh, uh, the work that I will, was about to talk about is work that I've been doing with Alan Daniel Santosh, who's a visiting student here, and we've had a lot of fun learning a lot of the stuff. And the kinds of things we've been interested in of late are things to do with a new distance function on Lorentzian space-time called the null distance function, which allows you to go backward and forward in time, okay? It allows curves that go backward and forward in time. They're not just going forward in time. And when you do that, you can actually construct a proper distance function in the space. Um, and actually, this is something that mathematicians have gotten very interested in of late. Um, we also looked at a very simple, we said, all right, this is a definition, but how can we use it? And we said, let's look at a two-dimensional case and try, just as we, you did shape matching of, of things in Euclidean space, let's try to do shape matching of causal sets in these lattices and try to measure distances between different causal sets of different sizes. And this is sort of the ongoing work and the calculations. And here's some weekend fun to think about image processing and house dog distance and how it's used to show, you know, you have to ask whether the left hand side figure, you know, can you place it on that? And can you construct an algorithm that will do that for you? And people use house dog distance for it. So, um, and the next time you look at leaves from the same, uh, from the same species, you can ask, well, how close, what is their house dog distance to each other? So, hope. Thank you for a very nice talk.
actually, especially when you showed this uh, Luca Bombelli's uh, work, I, I got reminded of this concept of relative, relative entropy. Yes. You know, the school back library divergence. Yes, yeah. That is uh, the thing that is used to compare probabilities or density matrices. That's right. And it's also like a distance measure. It's a distance measure. This one is apparently similar to what Buter's used. Okay. Uh, and uh, here you have basically because of the, the fact that the probabilities add up to one, you can put everything on a sphere. And the space, uh, the size of the sphere is related to the, the dimension of the sphere is related to the uh, number of causal sets of, a, of size n. Mm -hmm. And that space then gives you the size of the um, of the of the dimension of the sphere, and then you're basically looking at measures, and you can see very clearly in certain cases that you only get pi over two is the maximum that you can get because mm -hmm. it's a positive quad uh, whatever yes, yes. the the part oh, yeah, yeah. whatever the yeah, generalization it's also to of the something of this Bhattacharya distance. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. So yeah. those are yeah, yeah. So this distance, if I take two points and measure the distance, of course it depends on the embedded curvature of the space, right? So if I minimize over all possible space, is the flat space gives the minimum distance? No, or there not? is so no, that is the thing that you, you know, uh, the definition is very general. So in mm -hmm. principle, I mean, if you, I mean, as a physicist, if you approach that thing, you think, what does it mean to do it over all possible spaces? I mean, there's, uncountable number of spaces, I mean, uh, uh, LS1, <laughs> whatever of spaces that are possible. How do you, mm -hmm. so the point is that people, when they calculate these things, I think they basically use it to give bounds. A lot of mathematicians, when they use these, that particular very generalized thing, use it to give curvature bounds. And you know that, uh, but uh, that's why it's only very recently that somebody's so, uh, actually got a, you know, the sphere is the simplest thing you can do uh, to compare, and that, that seems to be the... So, the naive intuition that in the uh, flat space will have the minimum distance is not correct. No, because you can have hyperbolic... You see, the thing is also the embeddings have to be isometric, which means that you can't, like, I can't, even if I draw a sphere on a, a, a circle on a, on a sphere, that is not, I, or, or, you know, a ball on a sphere, or, you know, colored it up and... That does not have the same uh, geometry as in flat space. So I have to make sure the embeddings are isometric, that they don't change the intrinsic geometry of this of that thing. So I can't just embed it into anything. I have to embed it in a way that is that preserves that. So of course, if I embed it in a very higher dimensional space, I would may be able to find some subspace in which the curvature does what I want it to do. But all I'm saying is that if you did it in the same space, like you can't take a shape on on the sphere and then embed it into the two-dimensional plane, mm -hmm. because you can't do that without changing the geometry. So yeah. I guess even given two points, I can draw any number of spheres with different radius, which will pass through this point, and each of this sphere will give different distance. Also, I guess right. Uh, uh, yeah. Two points. If I don't restrict the radius of the sphere. But it's not so much the sphere that you're you're actually looking at the space itself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. So if I if I took a ball and I compared one with a bigger yeah, one, exactly. then I can get further and further apart, just as I would expect. That that makes sense, right? A ball of size one is uh, a one distance one away from a ball of size two, and so on and so forth, because that makes sense. And that's exactly what I would do. I would center them. I would shape match, and I'd only have the rim or the annulus around it, which I would. Um, so in some sense, it's a very intuitive thing. But uh, yeah, but it's very hard to do the general gromov hastov for all overall spaces. OK, uh, <laughs> uh, we'll uh, thank you. The organizers uh, would like to. OK, thank you. Uh, we'll uh, uh, invite our next speaker. Thank you. Uh, it's Kavita from Astronomy and Astrophysics. And uh, she will be talking about wideband antennas for cosmological experiments in radio astronomy. A very good afternoon, everyone. So today I'll be presenting about wideband antennas that are used for cosmological experiments at RRI. I have been associated with EM simulations for antenna design and analysis for the ongoing experiments. And today I will be giving a quick introduction about the nature of the wideband antennas that we use for these experiments. 
covering on the antenna characteristics, the requirements of the antenna and how we assess or uh, evaluate the best antenna design and I'll give a few example, antenna example that we have designed and deployed and a few challenges that are associated with antenna design as well as measurements. Before going on to the experiment, I'll give a quick uh, introduction about what are the two main characteristics that we look for assessing an antenna for the experiment that we are focused on. So the first important parameter is the return loss. So to tell what is return loss, let us consider an antenna that is connected with a RF system. Say the antenna is in transmitting mode. If the impedance of the RF system matches with the antenna impedance, the, there will be maximum power transfer and whatever is transferred, the antenna will be able to radiate. But if the antenna impedance is not matching with the system impedance and if there is the impedance mismatch, there will be a reflected component coming back at the antenna terminal towards the system. So the, there will be reduction in RF power that is transferred to the antenna. So return loss is nothing but it specifies the amount of reflected power with respect to the power incident at the antenna terminals expressed in decibel units. So lower the value of return loss, the lesser is the reflected power. So the next important characteristics that we have to look for antenna design is radiation pattern. So it is a graphical representation of the field strength that the antenna is going to radiate or receive as a function of direction. So looking at the radiation pattern, we can tell at what direction the antenna is radiating, what is the intensity of radiation at undesired directions and it can give an idea about the gain of the antenna, what is the beam width of the antenna and the efficiency of the antenna. So we'll move on to the science goal. So the first science goal is to detect the global 21 centimeter signal from the cosmic dawn observed in the frequency range of 40 to 110 megahertz. So to give an idea of the signal that we are going to detect, so the red color curve that is shown here is the signal that we want to detect and you can see the signal is having variation as a function of frequency. The shape of the signal is changing as a function of frequency and if you look at the magnitude of the signal, they are in the orders of milli Kelvin. That is the signal that we, are, that we need to detect. So the blue color curve shows the foreground sky in which this signal is imprinted and you can see the orders of magnitude of sky. It is 10 power pi orders of magnitude greater than the signal that we want to detect. The sky, we know that the sky is very smooth and if we are going to have an ideal instrument that can ma like measure the sky very smoothly, then we will be able to detect the signal. But the challenge is the instrument that we are going to use to measure the sky, it has to have a very smooth response over a wide band al uh, around which we are observing. So if the first part of the instrument is antenna, so the characteristics of the antenna, the response of the antenna should be very smooth so that we are able to detect a very weak order of magnitude of signal that is having variations as a function of frequency. So I had mentioned that the two important properties that we will look is return loss and the beam. So any antenna is going to have resonance at the frequency where the wavelength corresponds to the electrical size of the antenna. But we design electrically small antennas and we operate in the frequency window where the return loss is going to be very smooth and we will not compromise on the smoothness of the return loss. Because of this, the sensitivity of the antenna might be less, but still with minimum required sensitivity, we want maximum smoothness in the return loss. Next, the second characteristic is the radiation pattern or we can tell it as beam, the antenna main beam. We want the beams to be frequency independent. That is, I, I cannot have each beam the beams at different frequency, if they are looking at different direction, the spatial variations will be transformed as spectral variations and we will be again uh, having difficulty in characterizing the, like detecting the signal that we want. So moving on to the nature of the antennas that we want. So we cannot go for antenna array. We cannot go for antenna array or large dishes we, uh, because they are suitable only for measuring the 
spatial fluctuations of the 21 centimeter signal, but we want to measure the global average 21 centimeter signal. So we want dedicated single wideband antenna for this experiment. So moving on to the experiment, the first one is Saras, where we have deployed antenna on land. So here is the antenna candidate, which is a wideband conical monopole or a flat reflector deployed over soil. So the antenna was designed by Dr. Ragunathan. So here we had taken initially a homogeneous soil medium below the antenna into simulations and we had designed the antenna. But when we take the antenna to the actual location and measure the characteristics of the antenna, they do not match with the simulation. So why that happens? So let, uh, let us consider an example where I have put this antenna candidate over a homogeneous soil into simulation. So I, for the same site, if I have a dry soil, it will have a certain permittivity and conductivity. If the same location, the soil is slightly wet, then my permittivity and conductivity will slightly change. So because of changes in the permittivity and conductivity of the soil, so the antenna with, is surrounded by the medium and the medium properties are changing. So the impedance variation of the function of frequency will change. Because of that, we will see that the return loss shape that we designed for will be different when we have different soil properties. So that's, that's what happens because in simulation initially we had taken standard dry soil properties and uh, when we go for actual deployment, we don't get uh, the measurements do not match the simulation. And uh, one more thing, we take the antenna to different locations. Our sites are not fixed. So different locations, even the, if we are looking for dry soil locations, the permittivity and conductivity, they will not be exactly equal. Even small changes of permittivity and conductivity will lead to the change in shape of the return loss, which is very important for us we, because we want a very smooth return loss. So I cannot use a single antenna optimized over a soil at different location. This becomes a challenge. So, and we know that we cannot use a homogeneous soil because soil is having various layers and the permittivity and conductivity is going to be different across different layers. So if I have a homogeneous soil, we have two parameters for the soil. One is permittivity and another is conductivity. If I'm going to assume layers, what happens? Say example, we assume three layers. So each layer will have its own permittivity and conductivity. And there is the depth associated with each layer. So there are many important, uh, there are many parameters that is coming in. So we have assumed only three layers here. So going to this plot, so what we are showing is for the same location, a dry soil site location, if I assume a homogeneous soil, and if we, as uh, if we take into account three layers of soil characterized, this is one of the, um, like we took the properties of the soil from the literature for one of the dry locations where the top layer of the soil will be used in homogeneous soil simulations. So you can see that if we assume a single layer of soil into simulation and three layers of soil into simulation, the shape of the return loss is going to change. Because of that, we will lose upon the smoothness in the return loss. And the next plot, so he, another parameter that is associated with soil layers is the depth of the soil. So if the layer height is, go, if I'm not modeling the height of the layer, what is the impact is shown in the next plot. So I'm taking only the first layer. So the first layer, if I'm varying the height from 10 centimeter to 30 centimeter, you can see the shape of the return loss keeps changing. So it is very important that we characterize the soil across, if we want to deploy antennas on soil, it is very necessary to characterize the soil properties appropriately along with the depth of the soil putting into simulation before optimizing the antenna. And uh, another one challenge will be if we are measuring and if our measurements are not matching with the simulations, we cannot easily attribute the deviation in our measurement to any single parameters because there are many parameters that we can attribute for change in the shape of the return loss. So due to the, so we saw what are the challenges associated with uh, deploying antennas on soil. So to overcome these challenges, the science team at RRI had an idea to deploy antenna on freshwater lakes. So why lakes? So if we are able to choose appropriate depth for the lake, then we will have only a homogeneous water medium below 
and I had mentioned it is fresh water. So the permittivity is going to be stable with most of the sites they measure around 80 and we, the conductivities are is very less for fresh water and they are within certain range which we will be able to measure. So it is very easy to characterize water and put into simulation before we optim like optimize the antenna and easily we can take it to different locations because the permittivity is going to be very stable with very slight changes in the conductivity. So when we deploy antenna on water, you can see this is the antenna which is floating on the surface of the water using a raft which is electromagnetically transparent used to float the antenna on the surface of the water and below the water we will have the lake bed. So going to this plot, we will concentrate on the curves that are shown here below. So the blue and the orange curves which are very smooth and which we which overlay on each other is antenna deployed on water which has appropriate moderate depth and we can see that the measurement which is the blue color curve and the orange color curve is the simulation. They both match very closely. There is another scenario where you see a green dashed curve which is having ripples. So this is one of the measurement that was uh, that like it was observed in last July when the antenna was deployed in Ladakh and the return loss measurement had ripples and we were uh, like able to associate the ripples uh, that we find with the depth of the water. So the lake depth was very low uh, with an average depth of around only 1.7 meters and we could easily attribute the period of the ripple to the depth of the water. So if we do not have appropriate depth, the reflected component of the signal will not get attenuated enough and they will be interfering with the main component leading to the ripple in the return loss. So this is one of the challenges, very important challenge that we need um, appropriate depth of lake at least for the frequency band and the conductivity mentioned here at least 10 meters for our experiment. And other challenges apart from low depth of the lake, there are uh, other challenges. One is conductivity, they are going to change with location and the, uh, if the water is not going to be stable, what, ha what can happen is the antenna can move in and out of the water and the orientation of the antenna can change with respect to the ideal orientation, it can tilt. So because of this, if the, so the first condition, the raft can, the raft along with the antenna can move in and out of the water. So because of this, what have, uh, the, the, there will be change in the return loss shape as well as um, levels of the return loss and this variation will be changing with respect to time and also the tilt, the tilt is going to change with respect to time, the tilt will be different and uh, because of the tilt introduced, the beam will lose its symmetric property and we will have achrom achromatic beams and also the shape of the return loss is going to change as well as the level. So then moving on to the next experiment, this is to deploy antenna in space. So here we will be avoiding RFI and uh, we will over, well, like overcome the drawbacks associated with land and water based deployment. Here idea is to place the antenna in a lunar orbit, orbit like observing in from the far side of the moon. So here the antenna candidate that I have shown here again is the conical monopole antenna over a shape reflector. We might think that designing antenna in free space is easier, but there is uh, like equally challenge is present here because we are going to have a big bus that is going to sit, satellite bus that is going to sit below the antenna that has to be taken during this uh, like design stages because this metallic, big metallic element will again change the properties of the antenna which has to be included in the design. So which will include the RF digital and other spacecraft electronics. Um, so the, for the antenna candidate that we have designed, I have shown here the return loss is the characteristics that is the return loss is smooth as a function of frequency and the beams are frequency independent. But uh, the challenge that will be associated uh, with this design is for free space if we have a single monopole over a flat reflector beams are frequency independent. But we bring in the bus there will be free, like beams will start at the higher frequency to point at different directions that is towards the bus. And the maximum beam dispersion we observe is 18 degree for the bus dimension that we are currently using. But the same electrical length of the reflector, if I make it as a curved reflector, then we will be able to reduce the beam dispersion. So the curved 
shape that we have introduced in the reflector helps in both achieving smooth return loss as well as reducing the beam dispersion leading to better frequency dependent beam in presence of bus below. So the, here the main challenge is if the bus dimensions are going to change and if additional spacecraft elements are going to come in um, at each stage then we have to revisit the design and take into account they do not deviate the required, their impact is less on the antenna performance. So the next science goal is to detect spectral distortions from CMB observing in the frequency band of 2 to 4 gigahertz. Here the signal again to be detected, it, it is in the order of nano Kelvin. It is 10 power 9 orders of magnitude weaker than the sky at these frequencies. So they are qu looking quasi sinusoidal in nature. Again, they are having variations as a function of frequency. So again, we need a smooth return loss and frequency independent beam. Along with uh, another important parameter, we need to have minimum back lobe and minimum sensitivity towards horizon because the sky is itself is very low in magnitude and we will not be able to characterize the noise components that is coming and interfering with the actual signal. So we had, this is in the evolving stage and we had tried many antenna candidates and one of the antenna candidates is shown here. Uh, so it is a wide band dipole antenna over a large reflector, large reflector is necessary so that we have minimum pickup, ground pickup and uh, large reflector, parasitic large reflector, it has its own disadvantages. There will be scattering from the edges of the reflector which, so these scattered signals will interfere with the main beam giving rise to ripples and these ripples will be frequency dependent and uh, we want to avoid this ripple so we uh, like we try, we want to uh, like uh, change the shape of the reflector to avoid this and we had come up with uh, a reflector which is a logarithmically, it is a portion of a log spiral profile and here the scattering from the edges of the reflector will not be interfering with the main beam giving rise to very smooth uh, beams which are which are like not having any ripples that we observed before and you can see the measurement and the simulation from one of the solvers are closely matching and the gain towards horizon and back lobe levels are very low. Thank you. To summarize, the main aim here for the, for the cosmological experiments that are go ongoing at RRI, we generally look on smoothness of the return loss over a wide frequency and the gain variation should also be smooth as a function of frequency. And we optimize antenna for certain order of smoothness in the simulation or design phase, but we may not be able to achieve it in real time because antenna deploying in each environment is going to have its own sources of errors and we should be able to model those errors and deploying antennas on space in space is also having its own disadvantages or challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a good talk. We can take one very quick question. And yeah, nice talk. So my first question is, uh, you said that, that the response needs to be smooth because the foreground is much more larger than your signal that you are probing. So uh, can you mathematically describe what you mean by the smoothness? And uh, this is one question and the second small question is like, uh, you know, in space base, there is a lot of temperature gradient between the sun side and the dark side. So does that uh, this uh, temperature fluctuations and the uh, finishing of your material, how does that uh, affect the smoothness of the response? Okay. Thank you. Uh, so regarding smoothness, um, what we do is um, we take the return loss curve which is the transfer function of the antenna and uh, we try to fit it with the polynomial and assess the residuals that are left over and they have to be very low in magnitude compared to the signal that we are going to detect. And regarding second question, the temperature variations uh, can introduce deformations in the antenna and we have started to take those deformation into account into simulation. And we will uh, like uh, be sure, like we will keep that into account that it does not affect the residuals or uh, does not affect the sensitivity of the antenna. So we are taking the care of that into simulations. Thank you very much, Kavita. Uh, please accept a token of appreciation. So last talk for this session is by Professor Joseph, Joseph Samuel. And he'll be talking about geometric electricity for smaller and better clocks. I'd like to talk about some work on geometric electricity. It's a theoretical kind of work, but it has some practical applications. And I hope that it can be used to make smaller clocks and better clocks sometime in the future.
So I've timed it to about 15 minutes. I know, yeah, that's right. So this work has appeared in a paper in the Journal of Physics, Mathematical and Theoretical. And uh, it's titled Born Oppenheimer and the Geometry of Ray Space. It's quite a, well, geometrical kind of paper. But there's an application to cold atoms, which is what I'd like to talk about here. Because I know there's a lot of interest here in cold atoms. And actually, this issue is on the 80th birthday or it was supposed to be on the 80th birthday of Michael Berry over here, who has been working on the geometry behind quantum mechanics quite a lot. But I think because of COVID, the issue got delayed and it's probably on the 81st or second birthday. I'd also like to thank Sanjukta, who's in the audience for a number of discussions about clocks and cold atoms. And it's definitely improved my understanding and a lot of it of her understanding has gone into this paper. So here's the plan of the talk. I'll talk about, I'll give an introduction, uh, motivation for the work for three minutes. Talk about clocks for a while. And an important theorem called Earnshaw's theorem and its generalization. Finally, I'll describe what I mean by geometric electricity. It's a kind of force that acts on neutral particles. And the origin is not ordinary electric field, but some kind of a synthetic electric field. And finally, the application to smaller and better clocks. And of course, I'll conclude in a minute. So good timekeeping is essential for a multitude of applications. When we understand time better from a fundamental and operational point of view, this understanding contributes to our understanding of fundamental theories like relativity and quantum mechanics. This is a picture by Salvador Dali about time. And it also reflects the fact that time is considerably more complex, more complicated than anyone here can imagine. There are a number of applications of clocks, including uh, scientific applications. Pulsar timing is one of them. Metrology, the very large baseline interferometry. Global positioning systems, and this is precisely why you get your food on time when you order it on Swiggy. Otherwise, the guy would be wandering around the neighborhood looking for your house. Fundamental tests of relativity, and something like the GPS also in space navigation and measurement of the variation of constants like the speed of light and fundamental constants of nature. Time is the best measured physical quantity, so much so that we measure other quantities by using time. For example, we translate all distance measurements into time measurements by just defining the speed of light. We translate, we measure voltages by using the Josephson effect and looking at the corresponding AC Josephson frequency. It's also the least understood of all the physical quantities that we have. Einstein was faced with this question of what time is, and he decided that time is what clocks show, which then raises other questions, whose clock and which clock, and pursuing those questions is what led him to the theory of relativity. Now, clocks have been of two kinds, astronomical and terrestrial clocks. Terrestrial clocks can be of also two kinds, either those which have some kind of a periodic motion, like a pendulum, or something which have a decay, like the clepsydra, that's a Greek water clock. You let the water run out, or you, you let the hourglass and the sand run out. Of course, the sundial ha relies on the periodic motion of astronomical objects. And there's a very lovely book about the history of timekeeping and clocks. It's called The Longitude. It's called Longitude, and it's by Deva Sobel. And she talks about the importance of timekeeping for navigation. If your clock is a few minutes off, your longitude will be a few degrees off. And you might be in Westminster Abbey when you think you're on the high seas. And you might be on the rocks when you think you're in the English Channel. So Kelvin proposed, well, uh, in those times, astronomical clocks were much better than any of these terrestrial clocks because the day is pretty standard. But as time went on, clocks improved, the terrestrial clocks. Kelvin was the one who suggested that atoms can be used as clocks. And initially, atoms were kept in cells. But every time the atom bounced off the wall of the cell, it would forget the time. And that was a problem. So terrestrial clocks in laboratories these days are atomic clocks that are accurate to one part in 10 to the 17, which lose about a second in the age of the universe. They are better in accuracy, stability, and reproducibility than any of the astronomical clocks. One of the pulsars are pretty stable. The millisecond pulsar is quite stable, but by and large, the laboratory clocks are much better. You can have talk of clocks in space, 
And if you want a smaller cl clock, one that you can put on a chip, that is also being discussed these days. So my work is relevant to all these kinds of things. An ideal clock is an isolated atom at rest in a laboratory. Very hard to get that. And that's the challenge of this field. The challenge comes from Earnshaw's theorem. If you want to trap an ion in a static potential, there's an obstacle from Earnshaw's theorem. That comes because the free space Maxwell equations imply that the potential is a harmonic function. This could either be the electric potential or the submagnetic potential that you introduce. And harmonic functions cannot have maxima or minima. So you cannot have a trap, a static trap, where you just put an atom, an ion, and it'll sit there. Now you can think of trapping neutral, neutral atoms, which have a dipole magnetic moment, and then the energy is given by minus mu dot b. Now, there also there's an obstacle that comes from a generalization of uh, Earnshaw's theorem, which is called Wing's theorem. You cannot trap a magnetic dipole in a static potential. The reason is that the minimum of the energy is the maximum of the modulus of the magnetic field. And the square of the magnetic field is a superharmonic function. So it cannot have any maxima. It can only have minima because del squared of b squared is greater than zero. That's Wing's theorem. So one uses magneto-optic traps. And these are traps in which an atom is confined by a magnetic field as well as an optical field, which is dynamical. And needless to say, the optical field disturbs the atom considerably. So here's where some theoretical inputs come in. And this is called geometric electricity. It has to do with the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. This was an approximation that was developed in order to understand mole molecules. You separate the slow and the fast degrees of freedom and eliminate the fast degrees of freedom in favor of the slow modes and look at the slow mode dynamics. When you do this, well, in initially it was considered that the nuclear motion is slow and the electronic motion is fast. And when you eliminate the electronic motion, what you get is an effective dynamics for the nuclei and you find three effects. First is that the eigenvalues of the fast modes give you an effective potential in which the nuclei move. The second effect is geometric magnetism. And this is a discovery of Berry, but actually there were many anticipations, including Longwait Higgins and Pacharatnam from this institute, much earlier than that. And also Hamilton had some kind of an anticipation. And the third effect, which is not well, as well known as these two, is something called geometric electricity. These two effects are smaller than this one, but we'll come to that. There are circumstances in which these can be dominant over that. And this appeared first in a paper by Zeigelman in 1987. So I'm going to take a simple example to describe geometric electricity. Consider an atom with spin in a magnetic field. The atom has slow modes and spin is considered as a fast mode. And then when you eliminate the slow modes, you can find that you get synthetic gauge fields that are synthetic electric forces that act on the neutral atom. These are not subject to the entire set of Maxwell equations. They only have to satisfy two of the Maxwell equations, namely divergence of B equal to zero and curl of B plus DB by DT equal to zero, which are the homogeneous Maxwell equations. So they can avoid Earnshaw's theorem and we can use these synthetic fields to create static wave guides and traps, which may be useful in creating, well, in, in the cold atom laboratory sometime in the future. So the idea is we can get to smaller and better clocks. The paper talks about the different effects and isolates them, comes up with configurations of ordinary magnetic fields that generate the three kinds of effects which were on the last slide. We can get static magnetic field configurations for traps and wave guides, and these may be useful in cold atom physics. The geometric electric effects are described by a potential which is one fourth of the gradient of the direction of the magnetic field squared. This is a repulsive potential, and because it depends on the gradient, it becomes larger when you talk about smaller dimensions of clocks. So if you look at a tiny system where the magnetic fields can be of any size, but the gradients are very high, this dominates over the other effects that we were talking about. Also, the geometric magnetic effects do the same thing. This is dominant for smaller traps, and when you want to miniaturize clocks, put them on a chip. These are the forces that we should be looking at. So the conclusion is that static 
magnetic fields can trap neutral spinning atoms using geometric electricity. They can also provide waveguides for transporting them across the laboratory. Neutral atoms are less susceptible to stray electric and magnetic fields. That's because if there's a stray field, a neutral atom has a well, much smaller response than an ion. We get less disturbance from dynamic optical trapped near fields. And the proposal I'm making is for smaller and better clocks using geometric electricity. Thank you. I finished with. I finished much faster. <laughs> Thank you for a very interesting talk. We are open for questions. I know it's the title of your talk, so it's instances time. Uh, I'm not sure I understand fully why you've got this term geometric. Um, yeah. yeah. So I, I'll, I mean, uh, if you can just go back to those slides, that sure. would also perhaps be a bit helpful. But or I can write it on the board. Shall I? That? I'll go back to the slide and uh, maybe understand your question better. Geometric, this one? Yeah. Um, Okay, let, let me explain each of these effects. Huh? There are three effects that come in the born oppenheimer approximation. Uh, the eigenvalue of the fast modes is the eigenstates of the electrons, the energies of the electrons. And in our simplified model, it's the same as this quantity, which I wrote here. No, sorry. I wrote E equal to minus mu B. This is the eigenvalue of the energy of the spin. That is one of the effects we're talking about. The first effect is that. The second effect, e dot, uh, mu dot b, the mu dot b is the dynamic geometric potential, no, sorry, dynamic potential. That affects the motion of the nuclei, yeah, of the slow degrees of freedom. And this only traps one kind of spin. This is the kind of traps that you'll find in the labs on this campus. The downspin is rep repelled and the upspin is, upspin is trapped in there, whereas the geometric potential will trap both. Now, the second if geometric magnetism, you can understand very clearly. You take a bicycle wheel and you spin it on its axis. And you consider the axis as the slow mode and the, the wheel as the fast mode. Then you'll find if you try to move the bicycle wheel upwards, you get a force transverse. That's like a Lorentz force. That is geometric magnetism. Yeah, that's the very phase effect. That was also noticed in the born Oppenheimer days by Mead and Trullard and many other people. Geometric electricity is something which has been much less exploited in the laboratory and noticed in the theory. In fact, I didn't know about it. I worked it out independently until I saw this paper from 1987. And my paper gives a more transparent derivation of the effect. Now, geometric electricity is basically whenever the, uh, the, the, whenever the state changes rapidly in the ray space of quantum mechanics, that metric on the ray space pulls back to the metric of real space. And because the kinetic energy term has the metric of real space, you get an effective potential, which is a scalar potential, which is basically the size of the, the vector in the ray space pulled back to ordinary space, square of the size. That's the potential. The details are in the paper. Yeah. Okay, I can, uh, yeah, this is all I should say now, I think. So, just talk to me that, so when you have that, fast change from one uh, uh, magnetic state to another. Yeah. So there is an associated concept of Majorana flips, right? Because yes. if you yes. have a local flip. Right. So uh, how is that protected? Yeah, I understand that both the mm -hmm. up and down are trap state, yeah. but still there will be situations when the yeah. field so will go to zero. So that's right. And, and there it's yeah. untrapped. So the, this potential has the effect that it Repel, it's repelled from the places where the field goes to zero. Oh, that's also built yeah. in, is it? Yeah, yeah. Ah, there's okay. some very nice features. The other thing is that for smaller trap sizes, the geometric potential dominates over the dynamic potential. The E dot so That term. I understand. Yeah. Uh, if no other questions, let's thank the speaker for a very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. So let's come back for the last session of this event. So the first speaker is Dr. Sarvesh Kumar Yadav.
he has done his phd from iser bhopal and now he is a post doc here in the astrophysics department so today he will be talking about a non a non parametric method to investigate non gaussianity in cmb maps uh, thank you uh, thank you for giving me opportunity to talk in your in house in this in house meet and this work i have done at iser bhopal and this method of non gaussianity detection is uh, basically independent of model so we do not uh, initially con consider any type of model uh, uh, of non gaussianity and test the already whatever data we have we test against uh, we test the hypothesis against the data and you, we use some type of uh, method uh, statistical method to uh, check for any type of non gaussianity present in the actual cmb map so uh, the perturbations which are produced by inflation these are thought to be having a, a statistically homogeneous gaussian random field and the temperature and polarization power spectrum which we actually use to derive the cosmological parameters are uh, uh, is only uh, valid to use if uh, actually the fields are gaussian so it is it becomes more important to check for non gaussianity of uh, the uh, cmb and we also need to investigate non gaussianity uh, to better understand the foreground residuals and systematic present in the clean cmb maps further uh, unlike uh, gaussianity non gaussianity can be of numerous types which makes it difficult to detect and quantify using a model at a time so hence we implement a model independent method to uh, investigate non gaussianity in cmb maps using spherical harmonic phases so this is the formalism we can write the temperatures temperature fluctuations on cmb map uh, in terms of spherical harmonic coefficients alms these alms are actually uh, uh, complex quantity which have associated mod part and a phase part if uh, the if the uh, assumptions of uh, inflation that uh, these fields are gaussian then these alms need to be gaussian so if these alms are gaussian then what happens is this mod of alm should follow a distribution called rayleigh distribution whereas the psi alm should follow uniform distribution so we will be using this psi alm to investigate any type of correlations present in the cmb map thereby indicating some type of non gaussianity present in the cmb maps so this psi alm phases are uh, described by this formula where um, uh, it is the tan inverse of the imaginary part of the alm by the real part of the alm so to uh, 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 to find the correlation what we do is uh, we, we check for the hypothesis the hypothesis which is called random phase hypothesis uh, is that that the phases of spherical harmonic coefficients are independent and identically distributed in terms of uniform distribution in interval 0 to 2 pi this is what we are going to test this is the hypothesis and for testing the hypothesis we will be using the rao statistics so the rao test which it is it is a statistical uh, measure actually and it is a powerful test of uniformity of circular data our phases are circular circular variables so it is a non parametric order statistics uh, which is invariant under choice of uh, origin so if circular variables are uniformly distributed then successive observation should be approximately evenly spaced about 2 pi by n apart where n is the number of circular sample this is the assumption of the rao uh, statistics so any unusual large or so short spaces between observations this signifies the non uniformity in set of circular variables so this is the statistics so say we have uh, theta i set of uh, random variables i is goes from 1 to n so in the range 0 to 2 pi so we use this Uh, measure to obtain u in values where dis are defined like this in the range of 1 to n minus 1 uh, where so before applying this uh, statistics it is a uh, uh, we uh, it is a order statistics therefore we have to short whatever set of variables we have taken we short them in ascending order and then we utilize that this is a shorted version so we utilize them to obtain these dis and then we use this dis in this formula to obtain the uls so what we do is apply our method on non gaussian simulations 
and foreground contaminated 100 and 143 gigahertz maps. These we use in order to test the performance of our method. And then what we do, once we establish that our method is performing nicely, we apply on these five, five types of map of which these four maps, Commander, NILC, SEVAM and SPICA maps are actually various ways of obtaining CMB maps from the Planck mission. And then we use WMAP, we also use the WMAP ILC map from nine year observation of the uh, WMAP to uh, ch check for uh, any type of anomalous detections. So uh, before going ahead, what we do, uh, because these ALMs have not only contribution from signal, they have contribution from noise as well. So in order to, and we can see from this formula that these have contributions, the uh, phases have contributions from the noise as well. So in order to minimize the contribution of noise, what we do is limit our L mode, spherical harmonic L mode, to up to which we will be doing our uh, analysis. So we restrict it to 128 LMX. So what we do, so we, uh, we have three classes of test, class one, class two, class three. So class one type of test, we fix the, so these phases have two uh, indices, L and M. So each L has two uh, L plus one M's. So uh, what we do, we only take uh, uh, the positive M's and we fix the L value at a time. For the class one type test, we fix the L, uh, type one test is the test where we fix the L and take all the M's together and use them in the UN formula. Whereas type two test, we, we fix the M value and throughout, through uh, over all the L, L values, we take the M values uh, and we test it for the, um, uh, uh, we put in UN to obtain the value and this is called type two test. And in class two type test, we look into the correlation between the phases of the same L mode. So L is actually constant. And what we do, we look into correlation between a nearby M mode and next to nearby M mode. So nearby M mode, which is called type three test and uh, next to nearby M mode, we uh, call it type four test. Whereas in class three type of test, we try to look into correlation between um, uh, various uh, nearby L modes. Uh, phases of uh, nearby L modes. So we call it the type five test and type six test is the next to nearby L modes actually. So these are the three classes of test. Now, what we do, we use raw statistics to obtain the UN values corresponding to the test variable of each type for a given CMB map. So we also find UN values for 10,000 uh, 10, corresponding phases, phase set of Gaussian simulation and arrange the resulting UN in ascending order. So if the value of UN obtained for set of spherical harmonic phases for the map under test is greater than 95% of UN obtained for 10,000 Gaussian simulations, then it is a significant detection. So we put a limit. And then to, first of all, we want to test whether the our method works or not. So what we do, we generate non-Gaussian simulations. So this is a Gaussian distribution and we, uh, we uh, take a limit of minus A to minus B, and we sample some numbers from this uh, sample of minus A, uh, range of minus A and minus B. And what we do, we do a translation on this by a value of 2B uh, plus, uh, plus 2B on both sides. And what we, why, why we do this, I will show you in the next slide. So we take these values, we have done this using um, hit and trial method actually to obtain uh, gradually increasing non-Gaussian maps. So what we found that the random variables are actually, uh, so this green green curve, green curve, this is the normalized histogram plot for a normal uh, uh, random variable. And uh, this green is the Gaussian case, whereas this, uh, the other, other color is the, magenta color is the actually the uh, sample variable which we have obtained. So what we found that uh, gradually, if we take from uh, simula simulation one to two, non-Gaussian simulation one to three, we find that gradually this deviates from the non-Gaussian map and more and more uh, it, 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 go, it goes on uh, uh, increasing non-Gaussian character. So now what we do to obtain map from the, uh, those random variables, we multiply the power spectrum, CMB power spectrum, theoretical power spectrum and beam window function, pixel window function. And then what we see is uh, these are the uh, normalized pixel hist uh, value histograms. So this, uh, 
the green color is the uh, gaussian simulation histo pixelized histogram whereas the magenta color is the one we, which we obtain what we see that uh, though in the um, variable space uh, uh, non gaussian trees can be observed clearly but whereas in the pixel space uh, we find no such type of gradual uh, drastic change in the uh, 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 histogram so why this is happening this is happening because of central limit theorem because this relationship is sum over this alm so because of central limit theorem actual signal that was present in the spherical harmonic space this gets obscured in the one point statistics in the pixel space so this warrants that special care must be taken into account to study non gaussian entity either in spherical harmonic space or pixel space so these are the simulated maps we have which we have generated this is a gaussian simulated map whereas this is the non gaussian simulation map for type uh, simulation uh, non gaussian simulation 1 and this is 2 and this is 3 so uh, visually they, they are not very drastically different from each other even though there are some features but they are not drastically different because the scales are similar so now we have to test whether our uh, see whether the our method performs well or not to test the performance of our, all the six tests we generate 5000 non gaussian simulations of each of the three variety so we expect to detect more number of significant detection in non gaussian simulation 3 than non gaussian simulation 1 for all test so this is the histogram plot which we have obtained this is uh, on the vertical axis we can say uh, we can uh, these are each 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 was each one of them is a test this is the sixth test this is the first test and this is the non gaussian map 1 to this is the non gaussian map 3 so here what we can see that histogram plots indicate a small spread in the number of significant de detection for each test type and every non gaussian map type indicating that our method performs very well there is no such significant uh, deviation so the light green region shows the one sigma around the mean so uh, there is much no much error bar on the detection so using the those histograms only we, here we show the detection modes on the y axis and and the horizontal axis we show the non gaussian simulations 1 2 3 and each of these lines are uh, the test which we have applied we can see that on for all six test number of detections increases with non gaussian t indicating our method performs well the small error bar around each test uh, and set of non gaussian map indicate that our test works efficiently in detecting significant cases so further we apply our method on actually observed non gaussian maps planck foreground contaminated cme maps so so these are uh, 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 these are 100 gigahertz and 143 gigahertz planck maps so we have utilized them so uh, number of detections which we here we show the number of detection on the 100 gigahertz map uh, whereas the slash ng is the number of detection for a, a, a sim, single single simulation single gaussian simulations we have tested and what we can find that so uh, test 2 4 and 6 are very efficient in de detecting non gaussian signals in the foreground contaminated 100 and 143 gigahertz planck channel maps this also also shows that such correlation exists in these observed non gaussian maps so finally we apply on the cmb clean map so what we find, find found that applying the test type 1 this is the commander this is the smica this is the nilc this is sevm these are from planck this is the w map which we we get from w map observations we find that these are significant detections along with in bracket we have the p values corresponding to those detections so this is the type 2 test which we have applied and these this is the type 3 test we have applied this is the type 4 test and 5 test and 6 so we can see there we have lots of detections in most of the maps lots of detections but not significant significant in sense that not many are there so our conclusion is that our method detects accurately and efficiently correlations in spherical harmonic phases due to non gaussian t in spherical harmonic coefficients the clean cmb maps most l and m mode phases are consistent with random phase hypothesis with some exceptions the significant detections in clean cmb maps need further investigation for their origin thank you So it's the time for questions. So uh, why is uh, why are spherical harmonics uh, better uh, test for uh, non-Gaussianity? I mean, 
I mean, you can of course look at higher point correlations, higher order fluctuations in the temperature and then compare it if you, I mean, with whatever it would be from Gaussian. I'm not saying that it is better. I'm saying that it is also a place where one can look into. And uh, another question is basically when you are, <coughs> when you describe this non-Gaussian simulation, so you only took uh, uh, these, uh, these new samples from a one-sided distribution minus A to minus B. So, so I try to, um, yeah, make samples of non-Gaussian uh, random variables such that uh, the type of non-Gaussian T's which we are trying to detect, it manifests in increasing order actually. That is why we have taken. But then your next, uh, your next things which you showed, mm -hmm. uh, should not they be somewhat skewed at least? Yeah, it is. Okay, okay. And uh, uh, I mean, so the green one is the from the Gaussian uh, Gaussian random variable. Okay, and this one is shifted. And uh, like, why are you choosing still uh, the uh, for non-Gaussian simulations? Why are you still choosing from a Gaussian distribution? I mean, even if you're, I mean, you're sampling from a yes, yes, space, yes, we can do. Of course, I actually, I wanted to non-Gaussian, uh, but actually, why I, are you not taking? You you can take any distribution. Okay. You can take any distribution, but what we have to do is to design it in such a way that you get uh, 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 non-Gaussian random variables such that uh, the non-Gaussian entity goes on increasing. It was available easily for me and so I used it. That is why. You can I do could, more I complicated used, things, right? Yeah, it is, not, it is not that much complicated. Yeah, a simple, very simple idea. Okay, if, uh, if no more questions, then thank the speaker once more. And our next speaker is T.R. Vishnu has done his PhD from CHNI Mathematical Institute and now he is a postdoc here. So today he is talking about prob probing dynamical stability instability transition in a network by heat conduction. Good afternoon all. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Uh, today, uh, the title of my talk is probing dynamical stability to instability transition in a network by heat conduction. So I'll try to explain what is this dynamical stability to instability as we go along. And if time permits, I'll talk about the ongoing work on the heat conduction, which we have been uh, pursuing. <coughs> so uh, first of all, uh, we consider a coupled scalar field theory for the scalar fields phi1 and phi2 with a minimal coupling lambda, uh, where lambda is the coupling constant. Uh, so I'll explain why we are interested in this uh, field theory as we go along. Uh, so this field theory has this Hamiltonian, which has the usual klein gordon term, if you are aware. So uh, where phi, phi 1 is the conjugate momenta and this the field derivatives. And there is a minimal coupling term, which is also quadratic. And the coupling constant is lambda, which is a dimensionless coupling constant. So first of all, we regularize this field theory onto a lattice uh, with a lattice spacing delta. And then we can rewrite this uh, field theoretic ha Hamiltonian as a lattice Hamiltonian, where this uh, subscript 1 and 2 describes uh, the corresponding uh, variable, dynamical variables for the fields phi 1 and phi 2. So with these redefinitions, we can rewrite this uh, field theoretic Hamiltonian as this lattice Hamiltonian, where capital N is the number of lattice sites. Okay. So now, uh, though I have given this uh, complicated looking Hamiltonian, we can physically realize it as a simple network of oscillators, where uh, at each lattice site, we have two types of, uh, I mean, oscillators, harmonic oscillators, and there is a pinning term. And uh, so M, you can think M hat as a frequency of individual masses and this omega, capital omega as a inner mass coupling between these uh, uh, lattice sites. And lambda cap is a coupling between two different types of oscillators. So this is the physical realization of that Hamiltonian. Then since this Hamiltonian is quadratic and there are no in interacting terms, actually you can do some bit of algebra and figure out the normal modes of this Hamiltonian. So first of all, we re rewrite this, uh, this x1n and x2n in terms of 
their Fourier modes and then you take the symmetric and anti-symmetric combination of these uh, Fourier modes and that we call as x a k and x a k and then you can rewrite this complicated looking Hamiltonian as a sum of two types of oscillators. So now we have uh, basically p square plus omega square x square kind of Hamiltonian but here these x a k and x a s k are basically the linear I mean symmetric and asymmetric combination of the Fourier modes. So we have so now I will uh, motivate why we were interested in that particular field theory because that is the simplest field theory from which you can arrive at this kind of uh, Hamiltonian. Why this Hamiltonian is interesting because if you look at the frequencies of these oscillations you can see now omega s square is always positive that means omega sk will be always real. However, changing the coupling strength lambda you can make this omega a k imaginary. So this, uh, this field theory is kind of a, uh, I mean combination of regular and inverted oscillators. I mean you can think of them as a uh, combination of uncoupled regular and inverted oscillators. So this is the motivation behind choosing this particular field theory and because of the presence of this inverted oscillator. So if you do not understand what is an inverted oscillator as you know I mean you have for regular oscillator you have a parabolic potential but for an inverted oscillator this potential will be basically minus x square I mean minus omega square x square. So it will be an inverted parabola. So now we have these two types of oscillators in this field theory I mean the discretized version of this field theory and presence of this kind of uh, potential make this system dynamically unstable. So that is why we choose uh, this particular field theory and by tuning this uh, coupling constant lambda so you can have a transition from dynamically stable regime to dynamically unstable regime. So uh, that is the key. So basically though we know the system I mean the field theory can become dynamically unstable how to uh, diagnostic this or there are different tools in uh, chaotic theory to uh, basically quantify this uh, instability in the field theory. So one of that uh, such tool is OTOC out of time order correlator. So out of time order correlator is a measure of uh, quantum chaos and it is defined as basically the thermal average of commutator square of two uh, Heisenberg operators. So uh, why we are calling this as a measure of chaos to understand why this can measure chaos very well or chaos or the dynamical instability in our case in our system is not chaotic but it has instability uh, but you can use OTOC to measure this instability in the system to understand that uh, you take the naive semi classical limit of this definition. So if you consider this W and V as this position and momentum operator then you know in the classical limit you can rewrite these commutators as Poisson brackets and x of t p of 0 Poisson bracket is nothing but it is simply dx of t by dx of 0 and for a chaotic system uh, this will have, have a exponential time dependence. What is this dx of t by dx of 0 means how a trajectory change with respect to its initial condition. So uh, for a if a system is classically chaotic then the definition is it is uh, really sensitive to the initial condition. So the tra trajectories diverge if you change the initial condition a bit. So that you can see and the lambda is called the Lyapunov exponent. So uh, basically what I am saying is uh, this OTOC kind of capture this uh, Lyapunov exponent uh, if we condense a cl classically chaotic system. So if, uh, if our uh, quantum mechanical system which we are studying which has a classical counterpart and if, if it is chaotic then uh, the Lyapunov exponent what is the Lyapunov exponent for that classical system that can be understood from the OTOC uh, also. So uh, this is a good measure though if I said all these things if you do not understand I will give you a simple example uh, which is the our harmonic oscillator. 
So in a harmonic oscillator, you know how x and p evolve in time. Uh, so uh, we know the position operator will evolve like this and momentum operator will evolve like this. Then if you put that back into the uh, definition of the OTOC, then you can see basically OTOC is a sinusoidal function of time. It's basically cos square omega t. That means it, it has a regular behavior. So which is wh what we expect, right? I mean, because uh, harmonic oscillator is a regular system, so it should not have any chaotic behavior. However, if you change that uh, this omega to I, I omega, that if you go to the inverted oscillator, then you can see the uh, OTOC become cos hyperbolic omega t. And if you look at this function, these are exponentially diverging in time. So basically with OTOC, you can capture the instability in a model. So this can be basically elevated to our field theoretical model also. And uh, since our field theory also has a lot of uh, inverter oscillator as we increase the lambda, uh, then there also you can see the OTOC show exponential growth in time. And another measure uh, to understand uh, this instability is uh, circuit complexity. I'm not giving the definition, but uh, people have been uh, people are already investigated about the circuit complexity of this uh, field theory and they have found that it also grows indefinitely but as a linear function of time. Uh, so, uh, so basically you can understand the underlying instability of this model through different uh, tools of contact chaos. So uh, and you can see uh, there is a, a transition from stable to unstable region uh, by tuning the uh, coupling constant in the field theory. So that is what happening here. Uh, so uh, though I have given some tools, so uh, we do not have to go this far. We can directly look at the Hamiltonian and look at the dynamical metrics of this field theory or the lattice Hamiltonian and from the features of that uh, dynamical matrix also we can predict this uh, stable to unstable transition. To understand that, first of all we notice that this uh, a Hamiltonian is belongs to a class of Hamiltonians called quadratic bosonic Hamiltonian and uh, this quadratic bosonic Hamiltonian a typical quadratic bosonic Hamiltonian can be written in this manner where A and A dagger are the bosonic creation and annihilation operators and this is the hopping term and these are the pairing term and they satisfy I mean their this uh, parameters should satisfy this relation because uh, h hat should be an Hermitian, Hermitian because it is the Hamiltonian of the system and uh, delta ij should be equal to delta j because a and a dagger satisfy the canonical commutation relations. So if you rewrite this Hamiltonian in terms of this uh, array of, of operator which is uh, which I denote by phi hat then uh, this Hamiltonian takes this uh, particular form and you can rewrite the evolution equations for the A's and A daggers and you can rewrite it as a basically a matrix equation. But the interesting fact here is that for a bosonic Hamiltonian, the effective dynamics is controlled by a, uh, a controlled by a single particle Hamiltonian which is no more Hermitian, which, which will be a pseudo Hermitian matrix. This is because, uh, because of the presence of these kind of terms which are number I mean due to these uh, terms uh, the uh, these systems won't preserve the particle number. So that's why uh, the effective dynamics of quadratic bosonic Hamiltonians are uh, governed by a pseudo Hermitian matrix and uh, to see this uh, again you can we can go back to the usual uh, our harmonic os oscillator example which is uh, I mean if I am putting these uh, coefficients as alpha and beta and we re rewrite this uh, Hamiltonian in terms of the creation and annihilation operator, you can find the effective single particle Hamiltonian for this uh, single mode oscillator and it, it has these eigenvalues. As you can see, if alpha and beta has the same sign, then this, uh, these uh, eigenvalues are real. However, if alpha and beta has different signs, then it can become imaginary. That means, uh, I mean basically what, what does it mean? So if p square plus x square which is like an oscillator, uh, I mean usual regular oscillator then it is dynamically stable. However, if it is p square minus x square then it is 
like an inverter oscillator where you can have, uh, I mean, where the effective uh, single particle Hamiltonian admits imaginary eigenvalues. So, th there uh, the underlying, so if pseudo Hermitian matrix means uh, it, it is general, it has a uh, inherent PT, generalized PT symmetry associated with it. And if you go from the dynamically stable to unstable region, this uh, PT symmetry will be broken and you will end up with this imaginary eigenvalues. So, basically, this whole process can be elevated to our field theory also. And uh, by doing, I mean, there it will be a bit more complicated Hamiltonian, but uh, this is nothing but because we have now two types of fields, phi 1 and phi 2. So, you have to consider two types of uh, creation and annihilation operator, which are denoted by A and B. And the entire process goes through, and you can find a, a single particle Hamiltonian in this case also, which is also pseudo Hermitian. And the effective uh, dynamics is detected by again a non Hermitian matrix. So, uh, this is the, I mean, this, uh, all this is done in the equilibrium case. I mean, equilibrium, we have, so far we have uh, talked about only the equilibrium dynamics, but our major interest is to uh, understand the non equilibrium dynamics of this model. Basically, we want to understand what happens to the non equilibrium dynamics when there is a transition from this uh, dynamically stable to unstable region. So, uh, we are trying to understand this by connecting these two, uh, this network of oscillators to two different heat baths with at two different temperature and studying the heat current through this network of oscillators and trying to understand the properties of this heat current. So, we have some exact results uh, at, at different coupling limits. For example, if you couple these two networks into the heat bath uh, with the same coupling, then the model uh, admits. I mean, you can compute the uh, current in a closed form expression and there, there is no distinction between dynamically stable and unstable region because in that uh, heat transfer, the anti-symmetric modes or the inverter frequencies, uh, they don't contribute in the in heat transfer. However, if you connect only one of the uh, network, I mean, only one, of, one type of oscillators to the uh, bath, in that case, uh, you end up, I mean, uh, there the inverter frequencies also contribute to the heat transport and you can basically con compute the current in the linear response regime. I mean, what, uh, what is the temperature, low temperature dependence of the current in the linear response regime and uh, you can see uh, it has uh, these kind of behaviors. So, let me uh, conclude uh, by saying these two remarks, uh, which is the uh, uh, so, basically, the coupled scalar field theory under discretization serves as a toy model to understand dynamical stability to instability transition from various perspectives. Uh, so, we are basically trying to understand it from the non equilibrium dynamics perspectives. And we have been exploring the non equilibrium heat transfer in this model. The zero mode or the eigenvalues of the effective single particle Hamiltonian is related to the appearance of zero frequency peaks in the transmission coefficient beyond a critical coupling because after that critical coupling, uh, the inverter frequencies appear. So, we use this observation to analyze the low temperature properties of heat current in various stability regimes. Okay. Thank you for your attention. Let's thank the speaker for a nice talk. So, we are open for questions. Is it that it is the normal modes of the two chains independently and then a, like a center of mass and relative mass of the upper chain and lower chain? No, I don't understand. <coughs> so, this normal mode transformation is kind of e equivalent, is it to like uh, two, I mean, uh, you uh, you do a normal mode transformation of the upper part and the upper chain and the lower chain and then like a, a relative mass between, uh, uh, I mean, so it looks like that, right? Uh, ah, so, okay. you, do, you are saying in from the picture. No, also it? the transformation equations like 1n yeah. and 2n. So, like you, uh, it's like a normal mode transformation of the upper chain and lower chain. And then it's yeah. like a center of mass and a relative mass of, of the upper chain. Yeah, but chain. now we are going to the Fourier space. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's it. in the not yeah. in the real. Yeah. And uh, another question is so like normal modes. If you just kind of think of two particles uh, connected by a chain, and then basically in the normal modes give you uh, the frequency with uh, which they oscillate. Yeah. Basically, they're how they oscillate and so on. So, is there a, a, a visual picture like which you have for imaginary uh, these normal mode frequencies in terms of chains? Uh, no, I mean you can have this idea. I mean uh, it is uh, 
but uh, i don't know what is what do you mean by imaginary frequency in uh, i mean uh, no so your normal mode frequencies could be uh, imaginary yeah, right yeah. that's what you showed yeah uh, but after a point after a coupling even uh, uh, right. for a particular coupling it can be all real right uh, all this can be real for a particular right, coupling then, so yeah. that is the uh, i mean dynamically stable regime so where we don't have any in instability in the system so that is uh, like the pt symmetry unbroken regime so but once you tune the param i mean this coupling constant uh, you can get these inverted frequencies and which will result in uh, i mean no, what i meant is like okay. uh, you could, uh, for just if you consider like two particles very naively and then uh, you can basically uh, vis visualize the normal mode uh, oscillations right ah, okay uh, i mean in phase and out of ah, phase yeah, yeah. this thing so is there some kind of uh, no I, I, and nice uh, for the heat, for the transport how do you couple the uh, baths like uh, one upper and lower low, upper and lower both one side one temperature and this side both one yeah, temperature yeah if you couple with uh, same <laughs> same coupling then basically this uh, uh, i mean you can see the invert uh, the inverter frequencies won't contribute to the current expression so but if you couple it with uh, only if you couple only one of them then uh, that will contribute the inverted frequencies also contribute yeah. uh, i have one question so yeah. maybe my question so the, you are getting this uh, stable tra stable transmission and unstable transmission and you have different eigen values based on that the, what different you have very different eigen values based on that but i am not, not able to understand that so what is the cause of this uh, stable to unstable uh, transmission so physically what why it is happening physically why, why so uh, yeah this is uh, as far as i understand uh, uh, this uh, i mean if your uh, dynamics is detected by a quadratic bosonic hamiltonian uh, which is uh, i mean this uh, of the whatever we study which uh, i mean belongs to that class there uh, these dynamical vario variables can admit uh, i mean I instability so which is particularly because of the uh, the, num uh, the particle number is not preserved uh, for this hamiltonian so uh, i mean uh, the fermions you cannot have two fermions at the same side right i mean because of the exclusion principle but boson won't i mean it will permit that and the particle number is uh, not preserved for this kind of hamiltonian that leads to the dynamical instability uh, when you look at the uh, dynamics i mean we look at the evolution of this creation and annihilation operator that's my understanding okay. Okay. We'll yeah we'll discuss all yeah hi uh, so about the inverted oscillator uh, for some value of coupling let's say you can choose some coupling for which uh, the frequency for some for some normal mode can be like zero right okay yeah, yeah. Is that, does that lead to anything interesting yeah, in yeah. The so they, they are like the uh, transition points i mean uh, they are like the exceptional points in this uh, transition so you have uh, i mean these zero modes so they are important because uh, when alpha and beta equal to zero for example in this case uh, they have that slide yeah if alpha and beta equal either of them is zero so maybe i I should draw this. You take alpha and beta. So both positive, this will be dynamically stable. Both negative, it will be dynamically stable. And these two are unstable. Uh, yeah, this is uh, these are unstable re regimes. And basically, uh, at these axes. There, these are like the transition points where the uh, you cannot uh, invert this matrix g matrix okay but so they are like the exceptional points physically does it have any implication some physical implication so i mean in our case uh, in the study of heat transport these uh, i mean these play uh, i mean crucial role so yeah Right. 
yes otoc had so yeah. shown so it was like exponentially growing in the classical limit so can we expect that in the quantum limit if we see it can be logarithmic or something like that no that there also it, it is exponential because there it's it's it's, it's yeah. basically i mean you naively think it is simply you are taking i mean it will grow like this h, h bar i mean it is simply i s bar right i mean they are related the poisson bracket and commutators are related by i s bar by dirac condensation so it will have an h bar h cut with it that's it so let's thank the speaker once more and accept the gift yeah vishnu uh, so one one just oh. quick question uh, so uh, so i just spoke about this uh, putting them in a bath and looking at the currents i was wondering that uh, is it possible to uh, uh, determine some kind of entropy production or uh, something i don't know i mean this may be a i mean naive microscopic model microscopic model for uh, because this still harmonic oscillators but uh, yeah uh, i don't know i mean you can compute the entropy and entanglement entropy and all uh, associated with this but uh, yeah i mean a physical model how effective this uh, thermal i mean you can model some kind of uh, thermal conductance in the quantum regime but it is still a rudimentary model in that sense yeah so the last last speaker is deepak mehta he is doing his phd in the scm department so today he will be going he will talk about vesicle fusion mediates the tension regulation in the axonal membrane subjected to fast stretch stretch where we are looking for uh, whether tension induced synaptic vesicle fusion relaxes the axonal membrane or not here synaptic vesicles are the small spherical uh, organelles which Includes the neurotransmitter and neurohormones. So we are looking for whether they are fusing with the axonal membrane, helping in the tension regulation of the axonal membrane. So axon is a specific part of a neuron. So let's begin with the neurons. So neurons are the uh, informational uh, messenger in our body. So they can they can send. Uh, information from one body part to the another body part and they can send uh, electrical signal and chemical signal in uh, different areas of brain so this is a schematic of neurons so here is the cell body and in cell body you can see different branches these are known as dendrites these are uh, uh, called dendrites and basically they, they these dendrites re receive the signal and this cell body process that signal and Uh, that processed signal is then passed to the next neuron through this long tube like structure which is known as axon and our work is basically fo focused on this axon so this is one neuron schematic and our brain is consist of approximately 86 billion such neurons so our work is basically focused on how neuronal membrane is maintained by our body so uh, yeah and so why we are looking for the neuronal maintenance uh, because of few reasons one is the first is the length so in if you compare the length of these neurons with other cells they are the uh, their length is very long so just to estimate the size of these neurons uh, suppose the cell the size of cell body is equivalent to the size of rri so then you then your terminal will be ended somewhere in moscow so you can see the length of neurons this is for the largest neuron in our uh, uh, body so and the uh, main contribution is coming from the axonal part uh, so in our body uh, the length of axon can vary from few tens of micrometer to a meter long or it can um, uh, it can be more than that so so it has to uh, so there is a uh, need of maintenance because the length is very long since if if you got some damage so so if you uh, if you damage somewhere uh, neurons it will uh, basically it will damage your whole neuronal circuit so it is very important to maintain uh, these axons the second thing is the lifetime uh in our body almost all the cells are dividing cells basically they can divide and they can generate new ones from older ones so from one recent study uh 
uh, in you, you in 80 days. According to that, our body consists of 30 trillion cells and uh, every day approximately 330 billion cells replaced by the new, new one cells. So on average, we can say our body is completely new in every 100, 80 to 100 days. So uh, yeah, this is the fact, but for neurons, since neurons are non-dividing cells and they have to be non-dividing, otherwise we will forget our memory and we can suffer from many other diseases also. So our body effort, numer uh, uh, enormous effort in the maintenance of the uh, neurons, uh, our body uh, utilize approximately 30% of total energy of body only in the maintenance of the neurons while the percentage wise it is only just 0.3 percent of the total cell but it body putting but our body putting 30 percent of the total energy energy in the maintenance of the neurons so uh, improper improper maintenance of neuron can lead to many severe diseases like alzheimer which uh, leads to the memory loss and parkinson parkinson disease which uh, leads to the hormonal imbalance in our body so so neuronal membrane maintenance can be done by the reserve membrane. So what I mean here, reserve membrane. So in many cell type, you can see if you will give hypoosmotic shock, basically hypoosmotic shock means you will dilute the extracellular media. So solution uh, solvent will go inside, it will sell your cell uh, and area, area and volume will increase. So in many cells, uh, you can see if you will give hypoosmotic shock here, uh, they can expand their plasma membrane, outer membrane by messy amount and they can do that because there are so many imaginations, ruffles and high curvature surface like here you can see some cave-like structure. This is for mouse lung endothelial cells. So this cave-like structure called caviole. So here you can see this is for isotonic case where the osmotic pressure is balanced. The bottom is for hypoosmotic case. When the same cell is exposed to the hypoosmotic shock, you can see the cave-like structure reduced. So basically, these cave-like structure provide the excess area to the membrane here in case of mouse uh, lungs endothelial cells. But axons are very smooth and they have to be very smooth for the rapid propagation of signal. So uh, it is reported in previous literature and it, it has been shown in previous experiment that the axonal membrane is very smooth. But to see that thing in our neurons, uh, we are using, uh, we are doing experiment with chick uh, DRG neurons. So we did SEM, uh, SEM images, uh, uh, SEM microscopy here uh, 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 with the help of Yatindran. So uh, we checked the axonal membrane smoothness, but we got some roughness. This is because of some artifacts uh, because of the process, uh, procedure. So, uh, but uh, it is reported that the axonal membrane is very smooth, so we want to do uh, transmission electron microscopy for that, uh, so that we can get fine detail. Uh, okay, so it is reported that it is very smooth, but previous experiment have shown that it can be stretched up to 25% without rapture. Where we know that model lipid membrane and red blood cells are known to rapture at just 2 to 5%, so these red blood cells are also smooth. Axon is also smooth, but the axon can survive up to 25% stress. So we want to know what uh, what are the things which help in the uh, which preventing the rapture in the in case of axon. So we hypothesis uh, two things. So first, since the axon are very smooth, so we hypothesis that maybe the vesicle inside the axon are fusing with the outer membrane, the plasma membrane of the axon, and they are supplying extra lipid to the membrane, and that's why they are uh, help in the tension regulation of the membrane. And the second is the since uh, the, uh, the outer membrane is coupled with the inner cytoskeleton with the help of transmembrane protein. So, and uh, the inner cytoskeleton is a uh, elastic network which can also relax the membrane. So this is the second hypothesis. So we, are, we work on first hypothesis. For that we made one setup here. What we did, we made a flow chamber where we can grow cells. Uh, this is vacuum sealed uh, flow chamber. Here you can see the inlet on and outlet. The inlet is connected to uh, the diluted media solution. So we can pass diluted media through the neurons and uh, basically to give hypoosmotic shock and the outlet is connected to the syringe pump uh, through which we can control the flow rate. So here you can uh, see that before giving os osmotic shock, the uh, the shape of axon is almost cylindrical, but when we gave hypoosmotic shock, you can see this 
shape is become, it's not playing well. Okay. So the shape is become andaloid here. The shape is become andaloid. So this is known as purling instabilities. Uh, for this time, uh, the time constraint, I'm not going into too much detail how the shape is changing and why it is underlined and why we are only seeing a single wavelength here. So if anybody is interested, I, we can, I can discuss, discuss with uh, him later. So, so uh, yeah. Okay, so this, was, this experiment was done by Pramod uh, in his uh, post work. So basically he gave hypothetic shock and uh, you can see that this is the normalized volume, this is normalized area. Uh, uh, when he gave hypersmodic shock, you can see the volume and area is increasing. And from these two parameters, he derived one third uh, parameter, uh, which, is called, uh, which is called shape parameter. So which reflect the tension on the membrane. So you can see volume is going up when water is going inside and area is also increasing since the zone is stretching. But you can see the third parameter, shape parameter, relax before these two uh, parameter. So, which indicate that uh, somehow the axonal membrane become relaxed. You can see area is increasing. So, it has to be in uh, tension, but uh, uh, this parameter indicate that the, uh, that the uh, tension is relaxed on the axonal membrane. And also from you can see when this uh, purling instabilities arise, the area is somewhere here and the purling instabilities uh, disappear, the area is somewhere here. So we can see the area is added. And since we know that there, uh, there is no such ruffles and cavioli present in the exon, so uh, we hypothesize that maybe the extra area is coming from the vesicle which are present inside the uh, exon and they are fusing with the membrane and supplying extra area to the uh, exon. So to check that first we, uh, first we genetically express this vesicle and we make uh, them fluorescent using plasmid. So here you can see the vesicle or group of vesicle are moving along the exon. So these are vesicle inside the exon. So, uh, but we want to see when we are giving hypoosmotic shock whether they are fusing with the membrane or not. So we use slightly modified uh, version of this same plasmid, which is now PS sensitive uh, here. So basically now these, uh, this vesicle will be fluorescent only when they will fuse with the outer membrane. Inside the exon, they, will, they are uh, non-fluorescent because of the low pH. And when they will fuse with the membrane, they will get in contact with the extracellular media, which has PS 7.4. So they are fluorescent in PS 7.4. So we can see these dots are appearing and disappearing. So these indicate the fusion event happening at, on the membrane. So these are spontaneous uh, vesicle fusions. We are not giving hypothermic shock here, okay. So then when we gave hypoosmotic shock, you can see, so initially the intensity on the membrane is you can see here. So this is some spontaneous uh, 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 vesicle fusion. But when we gave hypoosmotic shock, you can see the intensity on the uh, membrane is increasing. So this is for the third, uh, third curve here. These uh, indices are taken in confocal setup. So you can see the when we gave hypoosmotic shock, intensity on the membrane is increasing, which indicate the vesicle fusion is uh, enhanced on the membrane when we, we are giving hypoosmotic shock. So, but we had one doubt, maybe when we are giving hypoosmotic shock, water is going inside and somehow pH is changing inside only. So, so we assume that if that is the case, uh, so we assume that if they are on the membrane, these vesicles are on the membrane, if we'll remove the extracellular media, which has pH 7.4 by pH 5. So that if they are on the membrane, uh, that fluorescent intensity should suddenly quench off. So we, okay, we did experiment, we gave hypoosmotic shock, we can see intensity is increasing. And we change, uh, when we change the extracellular media by pH 5, you can see the intense, intensity is suddenly quench off within milliseconds. So which indicate whatever it is, it is on the membrane. So next we want to know whether uh, the, the mechanism of this fusion. So, uh, uh, here, there is a one well-known mechanism of vesicle fusion, which is calcium-dependent way. So, by which these uh, vesicles fuse with the uh, neuronal terminal where they uh, transmit neurotransmitter. So, because of the time constraint, I'm not going into too much detail. But what happened when uh, a signal arrived here, they, there are some calcium ch channel which open up. And this calcium initiate this fusion uh, process here. 
So this is the calcium dependent way. It can be calcium independent since we are giving hyposmotic shock because of the some osmotic pressure imbalance. These vesicles can be pushed toward the axonal membrane and they can fuse with the membrane. So we want to see which which way it's happening. So what we did, we use one calcium indicator dye flow 4 m uh, We uh, we stain axon with this dye and we gave hyposmotic shock here and we can see uh, for this green curve. Uh, we can see the calcium level is increasing when we are giving hyposmotic shock. After some time, the calcium level is decreasing. Uh, for green curve, the calcium is present inside and outside both. But when uh, we chelate the extracellular calcium using EGTA drug, so we can see now we gave hyposmotic shock, the calcium is increasing inside, but the level is decreased. So, uh, so, uh, the, so mainly the contribution is coming from the extracellular calcium. So now what we did, we repeat all the experiment with calcium and without calcium. So uh, for uh, axon one to five is experiment with, with calcium. So you can see when calcium is there, the vesicle fusion is increased on the membrane, but uh, from six to 10, when the calcium is absent in the extracellular space, you can see there is no enhancement on the intensity on the axonal membrane. So which indicate that this vesicle fusion is calcium dependent. And next what we did, so we are doing this, these are very pre preliminary experiment. Here, uh, uh, we again analyze the uh, volume and area. From area and volume, we can determine that shape parameter, which tells the, uh, which reflect the tension on the membrane. So this is with, with extracellular calcium. With extracellular calcium means uh, the fusion events are happening here. So we can see the shape parameter relax before these two things, means tension is relaxing somehow. So now, uh, here vesicle fusion is happening so we can say that vesicle fusion is happening in the tension relaxation uh, helping in the tension relaxation and now when we chelate the extracellular calcium we saw there is no there is no fusion event so and you can see the shape parameter is not relaxing now it means that tension is still on, on the membrane so which indicate that the this vesicle fusion on the membrane axonal membrane help in the tension regulation of the axonal membrane so these are the conclusion. So vesicle fusion rate is enhanced after hyposmotic shock and this fusion is calcium dependent and rapid fusion may help in the buffering membrane tensions. Uh, our future plan are these uh, are the following. Since right now, whatever we are doing, we are uh, giving hyposmotic shock, which is not very clean uh, experiment biochemically. So we, we, we developed, uh, we, we made a P PDMS structure so uh, we we grow we will grow the cells on pdms uh, device and will stretch so it will be a more biochemical clean biochemically clean experiment so we are going to do that and right now whatever we are doing that is happening globally on the axon so we want to see the local effect for that we are developing optical teaser setup and by changing local calcium channel response we want to see what will happen with the vesicle fusion on the membrane so yeah thank you So if you go to the last graph you had shown, uh, there's suddenly a discontinuity in the data. Uh, yeah. So actually this uh, this is because uh, we are giving hyposmotic shock. We are passing solution from that chamber, flow chamber. And uh, the uh, there is a focus defocus problem in the, in the setup since water is flowing, solution is flowing. So uh, the neuron can be go up and down if, and it will be sometime focus and defocus problems there. So these are very preliminary experiment. We want to repeat uh, initial trend whatever we are getting, the, the, the shape parameter is not relaxing in second case, but uh, we want to see, sorry. We want to see detail till here. So we can see there is a uh, shift. Uh, here, uh, although here is some discontinuity, but for now, uh, the thing is, uh, we want to see this, uh, whether it is shifting or not. So we did several experiments, around 10 experiments, we are getting the same things. Uh, here, yeah, discontinuity is there, because this is because of the uh, focus defocus problem, since water is flowing. Uh, also in one of the graphs, uh, some slides ago, there was a sudden uh, yeah, dip in the, drop yeah. in the fluorescence, all, this, all of a sudden. Okay, so what is, uh, okay, here we, are. we can see that when we are giving hyposmotic shock, the intensity on the axonal membrane is increasing. So, but our doubt is that 
maybe this is whatever this is intensity it is not on the membrane it is inside the exon since this plasmid is now ps sensitive so in, uh, so maybe when we are giving hyposmotic shock water is going inside and that somehow somehow ph is changing inside only that was our doubt so what we did we assume that if it is on the membrane if it is on the membrane it should suddenly quench off if it is inside it, it will take some time so that was our assumption and it it quench off, uh, quench off within milliseconds so we can say whatever it is it is on the membrane where do you derive the axons from sorry the where do you derive the axons which you are studying from i mean the the axons i mean these membranes what you are studying yeah. where do you derive it from Oh, sorry. Yes, uh, actually, these are chick neuron. Chick neuron. We dissect chick neuron, and we are getting from. So, if not, let's thank the speaker once more. Yes. So, accept the gift. So, this was the last talk of this session. Not only this session, but. today's scientific event so i think the most interesting event is still waiting so after this we will gather for the for the photo session and after that we are going to start the cultural session and after this the gala dinner okay I, this time i heard that the, uh, the gala dinner is going to be more interesting so let's see what happens i'm organizing many such other uh, events all through the year right and uh, in particular i also wanted to commend the team for a beautiful logo you know i did, uh, not noticed it before at the time of the inaugural thing but you know uh, i'm really glad that you know students are putting their heart into it and you know uh, i'm really appreciate uh, you know your efforts to keep the you know scientific ambience here live and vibrant thank you so much